Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to have everyone here for another session of the Learning Salon. We are extremely delighted to have Chris Summerfield today with us. And John will be joining us in a couple of minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and start by um, uh, mentioning a couple of things about the salon as usual and then introduce Chris. So the Learning Salon is a forum where we discuss uh, bridges and contentions between artificial and biological learning. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary audience, as you all know. So if you don't know something, there is no, uh, um, there, there are no dumb questions as, as, as long as it's asked uh, politely. And uh, it's okay also to disagree and express disagreements as long as it's respectful. So feel free to ask about uh, clarification questions in the chat area below or put your questions in the ask a question area and vote on each other's question. If you say ask for me, then I'll know that you don't want to appear on screen. But if you don't say that, then I might ask you to join us on screen if there's time so that you can ask your question on screen. And we really encourage that. Um, we especially encourage students and uh, more junior uh, scientists or uh, philosophers to ask questions and show up uh, to basically practice in a kind of a friendly setting, also just asking questions and disagreeing respectfully with each other. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Chris Summerfield, who many of you know. Uh, Chris is a professor of cognitive neuroscience at Oxford and also a staff scientist at DeepMind. And I learned today that he's had his group uh, at DeepMind for about 10 years. And also his group there works on applying um, computational methods to social science problems, which is very exciting. Another thing that, as you all know, we don't introduce people with accolades, but with uh, fun facts about them. Uh, something that I always remember is uh, that uh, before COVID, when none of us had no choice but no longer travel, uh, Chris was an advocate of traveling less for conferences or for talks and um, just generally uh, doing less air travel in order to uh, care for the environment. And his lab was one of the first that I saw. They actually had a statement uh, on their website, um, which was a very strong memory in my mind that uh, people would be vocal about their environmental concerns. So that is my fun fact about Chris. Um, with that, I want to invite you, Chris, to share your screen and everyone to remember to ask their questions in the ask a question area or in the chat if it's for clarification. Amazing. Thank you, Ida. Thank you. OK, can people see my slides? Yes, perfectly. Cool. All right. So yeah, what a privilege to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. And yeah, so what I want to do in this talk is, you know, I'm not going to present you with any data. I'm really not even going to tell you about my ideas. What I want to do is kind of open up a sort of space of ideas, which I think would be fun to discuss. Um, and, you know, kind of try to, so we can try to navigate kind of what are the, the conflicts and the consensus within this, within this space. And it's very general. Um, so the title of my talk is, um, is what are we like? And the reason for that is because, so I grew up in in the UK in the 1980s. And it, at that time, there was an expression, those of you, some of you may know. So um, if it was a sort of generalized expression of, of disdain in some ways. Hello, John. And Hi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm really sorry. I'm in Dublin in the street being a complete delinquent. So please continue. No problem at all. So the so the expression so there was an expression which is what are you like, and it was this expression which people used to use if you said something like sort of you know particularly ridiculous or or incomprehensible, and so so I would strongly of course you know encourage you all to use that uh, tonight to use it liberally in um, in discussing with me discussing the talk, um, but the reason why I called the talk this is because you know what really I wanted to to get a get a sense of like. Um, a question which is not focused on a specific topic within neuroscience or machine learning or cognitive science, but is really very broad. And it's kind of like, what is the nature of natural intelligence? And what is it that makes natural intelligence special and different from general intelligence? And I, you know, I know that's a very broad question, and I, I hope it's, you know, completely aligned with, with the discussions that go on, go on here. Um, so, um, you know, what, what, 
why pose this question? Well, I think, you know, kind of one of the, the starting point for my talk is that, you know, if you think particularly about neuroscientists, right? So neuroscientists, the way that we, we, we do our work in general is to divide and conquer, right? So what I mean by that is, you know, kind of as scientists, we're incentivized to pick a topic and to focus on it. So that topic might be, you know, maybe you study um, the navigation system in the rodent, or you study the attention system in the primate, or you study social cognition in humans. But you're really incentivized to focus on one specific part of how intelligence works and not how it all fits together. And, you know, kind of my perspective is that over the past sort of five or 10 years, what's happened is that neuroscientists have started to look across the fence and they've realized that actually in AI research, you know, although not all AI research um, is or should be an inspiration for neuroscience, there is, a, there is something that AI researchers are doing, which neuroscientists are not doing. And it's, it's precisely that question of asking, how do we put stuff all together? And the reason why AI, AI researchers are doing that is very simple. It's because they have to, right? And in particular, you know, if your goal is to build large scale situated embodied agents that can do clever stuff in dynamic naturalistic 3D environments, then you do not have the luxury of focusing only on navigation or only on attention or only on social behavior. You have to solve the whole caboodle, right? You have Your agent has to have perception and it has to have attention, it has to have memory and it has to have control. And it, importantly, it has to wire all those components up. And I think you know what's become clear over the past few years is that actually you know, understanding each of those components in, in isolation is not the hard part. The hard part is really to know how it all kind of fits together. Um, and so, you know, kind of what what, what I want to do just to, to to open up the discussion is to think about sort of three possible answers to this question of like, what is it that's special about natural intelligence? And I've, you know, in the spirit of sort of random neologizing, I've I've invented three terms which I think describe those positions. But you'll probably recognize that they map onto quite familiar sort of you know cultural um, positions within the uh, machine learning and neuroscience. So I call them partitioning, recycling, and accumulation. And I'm going to talk particularly about partitioning and a little bit about recycling. So partitioning really is the idea that um, we need um, constraints that are tailored to the natural world, right? So we need to kind of cut up computation in interesting ways. And um, we need to do that in order to um, to 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 uh, to, to build processes which are which are unique, and I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, so um, recycling is um, also should be familiar. It's kind of the idea that um, familiar to many uh, machine learning researchers that you know kind of a big model with lots of training data will always generalize inevitably. Right? And, you know, this is a view that I associate in particular with people like Ilya Sutskeva, right? Who says you know kind of like build it big, and you know success is guaranteed. Um, and maybe maybe he's listening in. He can correct me. Um, and the last one, which I call accumulation, which I think is one we talk about less, and that's the idea that really what's critical to intelligence is some notion of how information is stored and transmitted. And you know that could mean in a memory system, but it could also mean through externalization, and particular through accumulation, not just of knowledge over the lifespan, but accumulation of knowledge in a culture on our ways of sharing it between each other in natural language and in, in our social behavior. So, you know, I kind of see these as the sort of, you know, these are the, the, the these are, this is one way of clustering the solution space for thinking about the question that I'm asking. Okay, so I just wanna talk a little bit about partitioning. So, you know, kind of partitioning begins with the idea that, what, you know, one thing that's really characteristic of our mental life is that it's full of things, right? And these things, are basically, you know, you can think of um, ways in which we cut up the cut up sensory signals and divide them into discrete entities. Um, and those discrete entities, of course, might be things like objects, or they might be categories or symbols of some sort. Um, but they might also be kind of, you know, more abstract. Um, uh, might might be more abstract things like, you know, kind of. Um, the elements of a formal language or words in natural language um, or, or, or symbols in, in some other symbolic system or a mathematical system. And, you know, kind of the, this view of what's special about humans says that, you know, what humans are able to do is to construct systems of meaning by 
um, composing together these things into kind of chains which express the relations between them or, or into patterns which express the relations between them. And that's how meaning is synthesized. And that's how we understand the world and are capable of um, intelligent behavior. And, you know, kind of this is a view, obviously, which, you know, people who advocate for sort of more, um, they talk about, who talk about more about symbolic systems or kind of the need for, you know, to, to meld deep learning with hybrid systems tend to advocate for this sort of view. You know, and so there's a claim that's often made, and you know, you will know many people who make this claim, and it's that the richness of human mental life is really due to a special ingredient, and that is something which allows us to kind of compose these representations together, right? So, you know, you might have a representation of an individual like Yoda, and an emotion like anger, and a concept like the stock market, and you can put those together in your head, and you can say, well, imagine that Yoda was, um, you know, kind of really angry because he lost all his money in the stock market. And for many years, the claim has been that this is what humans can do. And this is what AI systems, particularly deep learning systems, are totally unable to do. Right. And, you know, to some extent that uh, was true, but it's not true anymore. Right. And, you know, I think that this is the, the reason why I want to highlight um, this particular point, because, you know, this is where I feel that the discussion is in contemporary uh, machine learning, which is that, you know, how is it that a system which does not have explicit inbuilt compositional um, computation is nevertheless able to take these different concepts and literally compose them into uh, scenes which clearly, you know, kind of mix, the, they, they compose the concepts in a way which humans will understand. And so the image on the right that I'm showing, you know, this is an image that many, many of you will have seen, maybe this particular image um, or, or um, others like it, which are generated by OpenAI's um, text to image a generative model known as DALI2. Um, and this is this this image was generated in response to a prompt, which is, you know, imagine that Yoda's angry about losing money on the stock market, exactly as I said. Okay. So to try to think a little bit about this, let's take a step back. And, you know, kind of if we think about how this is solved in the brain, um, then, you know, kind of the scene understanding in the brain um, is something which, you know, kind of we know that there are specific dedicated computations which are um, involved in scene understanding. We know that because if you have lesions, particularly bilateral lesions of the posterior parietal cortex, you have very specific problems with um, scene understanding. And um, you, the, the, the intuition about what makes scene understanding um, difficult is that knowing what objects in a scene are not in, it's not enough to understand what's in a scene, right? And that's what I'm trying to illustrate on this slide here. You know, if you take these four pictures here, they all involve two objects, right? There's a man and a car. But the relationship between the objects in, this, in each image is entirely different. And understanding the scene requires not just knowing that there's a man and a car, but knowing what the relationships between them are. Specifically things like, you know, is the man inside the car? Um, is the man bigger than the car or smaller than the car? You know, these properties are what allow us to um, understand the scene. So it's understanding the relationship between objects, which is critical for, understand, for scene understanding. And, um, you know, kind of the reason, one of the reasons why we can understand the relations among objects, um, I would argue, and others have argued, is that it's because the brain, unlike many contemporary uh, deep learning systems, um, has evolved to represent space explicitly. So in order to represent the relationship between objects, you need a substrate in which to represent that those relationships. In other words, you need space itself. You need to represent space itself. So, you know, if you if there are two objects in a scene, in order to know that those two objects are actually separate and different, you need to have some notion of space because otherwise they just lie on top of each other. And that's exactly what happens, by the way, if you have lesions of bilateral posterior parietal cortex. And these representations of space have come in different shapes and sizes. And, you know, there are prominent ones in the macaque parietal cortex. We sometimes call that a salience map, and they represent, tend to represent the relationship between objects. There's also, of course, um, you know, representations of like not how objects relate to each other, but how I relate to the world in allocentric space. And those tend to be in the medial temporal lobe um, in the um, hippocampal entorhinal um, system. Um, and I just want to say one thing about, you know, kind of one, one, one idea, which I think is emerging. It's not my idea, but I think it's an, uh, um, an idea which is emerging in the community, which is that 
the one reason why these large um, um, new, new large deep learning systems are able to engage in really impressive forms of composition, like the Yoda example that I gave you, is that they rely on an algorithmic innovation, which rather like biological brains, is specifically um, tailored to multiplexing information about what is in the world and where it is. And so the transformer, so, you know, DALI-2, like GPT-3 and many other uh, recent uh, large-scale models is a transformer model. It's a hierarchical transformer model. And um, transformer is a specific algorithm which separately, basically what it has is kind of, you know, separate computations um, that are applied to the position, for example, in a sentence, the position that a word occupies and then the, the semantics or the embedding of that word itself. And those two things are, 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 are processed separately. And the transformer actually computes the, what, you know, what I've called here a relation matrix. It's not really a relation matrix, but it is a, it is a, it is a, it is a matrix which tells you um, the, patterns of, um, the patterns of relations between each object in a sentence and every other object in a sentence. So if you have a sentence like the postman delivered a parcel yesterday, transformers learn that the word parcel is strongly related to postman, whereas the word yesterday is not. And that's what gives them their, their generative power. I um, mean, this idea, if you're interested in this idea, there's a really nice preprint by James Whittington and Tim, Tim Behrens, which I think elaborates on it and relates it to a model which they have built of the hippocampus. Um, so very briefly, I wanna talk about recycling. Um, and, you know, kind of recycling, by recycling, what I really mean is the process of using abstractions to generalize. And, you know, kind of um, it has long been conjectured that one thing that's special about natural intelligence um, or especially about human um, intelligence is that our mental life is full of abstractions. We're capable of understanding things that go beyond the physical properties of objects and sensory data. And, you know, that's true for kind of semantic categories like the examples that I've shown up here, shock, Africa, winter or, or Roman. Um, but it's also true of like really intangible things that are kind of difficult to visualize, like justice or the concept of contagion, right? Contagion you know, something we're all familiar with because we just lived through a pandemic. But, you know, contagion ideas can also be contagious as well. It doesn't have to be about a particular domain, right? Um, and so these um, really abstract ideas seem to play an important role in our intelligence. And, you know, of course, a longstanding goal of deep learning. And in fact, you know, kind of if you think about it, the, the, the whole kind of basis for what we're doing when we build, um, you know, deep, large scale deep learning systems is we're trying to, to train them to learn invariances that allow them to generalize. And indeed, the, the top row here um, is, in fact, you know, these are um, images generated using a feature visualization technique. Um, in a large scale image to text uh, model, again, be built, called CLIP, again, built, built by um, OpenAI. So, you know, kind of in this paper, they argue that these are rather like um, the representations which you see also in the medial temporal lobe, um, which code for reasonably abstract semantic concepts like particular individuals or famous buildings. Um, but the the, the point I want to make here is that maybe, you know, kind of in deep learning, we've thought a little bit, um, we, we've overemphasized um, or over relied on, the, on, a, on a simple idea, which is that if we can learn a big enough through, through enough data, enough varied data and large enough models, if we can learn a big enough conditional distribution, a powerful conditional distribution over the data, then that generalization will come for free. So in other words, you know, if we um, learn about a bunch of data, then if we get new cases um, which conform to the same data, then we'll be able to draw inferences that, you know, kind of about what the appropriate category or response associated with those new samples of information will be. And of course, this is the premise of um, so much of what we do in, in machine learning. But, you know, kind of the problem is that the, the natural world is not only rich and varied, the natural world has another property to it, which is really difficult to deal with. And that is that the natural world is open-ended. And by open-ended, what I mean is that the distribution of outcomes and of actions and of latent rules, latent causes or rules, that can change without warning. And when it does so, what happens is that you get data which is out of distribution. And that data requires you 
not only to, it's not enough then to be able to interpolate from your big conditional distribution. What you need to be able to do is to extrapolate. And as we know, you know, kind of for various reasons, most deep learning systems are really, really poor at extrapolation. And so, you know, what tends to happen is you train your system on a particular problem, even if it's a big and ugly problem, and your network does really well on that problem after you've trained it to convergence, but then you come along and face it with a new problem and it's rubbish. And this is, you know, the paradigmatic challenge that we face and that humans seem to have challenged, seem to have tackled. But, you know, kind of if you think about the same thing applied to humans, right, you know, in a way, you know, that, that we often claim, well, humans are really good at transfer learning. You know, kind of if we put them in novel situations, they can recycle their old knowledge. And this is, you know, you read many opening papers, the opening lines of many papers in neuroscience and machine learning, and it makes this claim. But if you look back, you know, in the late 20th century, cognitive scientists spent about 30 years trying to understand actually whether human, or maybe a century, trying to understand whether humans were any good at transfer learning. And, you know, my reading of that literature is that the answer is a resounding no. So humans are not really good at transfer. It's very difficult to have to put a slide together that illustrates a negative effect. So I just have a bunch of quotes from review articles that say basically humans can't do transfer learning. And you know, for me, you know, the, the, when I think about this, the anecdote that springs to mind is you know, once many years ago, I was in Korea, and I was trying to buy a train ticket uh, from a machine in a you know that was um, that that was giving me information in a language which I didn't understand, and you know without the benefit of natural language and without, you know, even, even um, with the priors that I have a lifetime of buying uh, metro tickets, you know, I was completely um, befuddled and unable to solve this problem. And so I think one of the puzzles is that humans are not very good either at this sort of interpolation problem. But I think that is something that we're quite good at. And it relates to this question of composition that we talked about before, talked about before. And that's that, you know, kind of we are good at sort of putting things together on the fly. And in particular, you know, if we've learnt in a complex domain, if I teach you one dimension, so for example, I teach you that there are a bunch of yellow animals. And, you know, in another dimension, I teach you that there are a bunch of different colored birds, right? And you understand the relationship between those two variables. People seem to be naturally very good at factorizing the information and then recomposing it so that you know you know that there are yellow things and you know that there are birds. And that what that allows you to do is to put together um, new, you know, to use that information. You know that there are yellow elephants and you know that there are green birds, and you can put that information together to infer that there are green elephants. Um, and this was the um, uh, this this experiment was that this this idea was the inspiration for an experiment which we ran recently, which shows that actually people are really really good at this, and they're particularly good for it, good at it in situations in which you strongly encourage them to factorize by giving them a curriculum, which blocks information in time, so that people can capitalize on time to know how to factorize the world into its components. Okay, so. I don't have much more to say, but I just want to say, you know, kind of one word really about accumulation. And I think this is something we need to think and talk more about. And really the, the idea is just that, you know, all of our learning is cumulative and it's cumulative in so many different ways, right? And I think, you know, one way in which, one way in which learning is clearly cumulative is, you know, we're capable of lifelong learning. We're capable of continually learning across the lifespan. And I think that one thing that we do that it feels like deep learning systems don't do is that we're really good at knowing when to cache our knowledge and when to sort of, when, and by ca to cache it, what I mean is we're really good at knowing kind of when we've sort of learned something well enough and then we kind of lay that down as a consolidated memory trace that we then don't touch and then we learn some other stuff, but then we can reuse this um, cached knowledge in a kind of really fluent and habitual way whilst we're learning other knowledge. And I think this has to do with dual process models, has to do with a bunch of other things. But that process of caching, you know, of course, is not limited to memory, right? We also cache information by, for example, writing stuff down, right? We write notes to, to ourselves. Um, we cache information by discussing ideas with other people, and then they become repositories for ide our ideas that we can get back from them. And, you know, as a culture, as a cultural unit, we generate institutions and we generate, um, you know, kind of cu uh, uh, cultural artifacts, mimetic processes, um, you know, the arts, drama, fiction, that, um, that store our knowledge 
and that allow us to then sample back um, in order to behave in appropriate ways. And you know, clearly, um, you know, in machine learning, people are people awake to this idea, and there's you know really rich seam of research in multi-agent research and so on. Um, but I think this is something that we have we can exploit um, much much more. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This was really awesome. Um, I think that, um, oh, I'm glad that John is now somewhere stationed. So we have John back. That's great. <laughs> You're muted. So I'm going to, yeah, go on. Sorry, that was great. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I think that. It would be really great if John starts asking, just because I'm a little concerned about his connection dropping out. So John, do you wanna be the first person? And by the way, I don't know if you see the chat, people are sending you virtual claps. <laughs> oh, you're muted again. Let me unmute you. All right, you're unmuted. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chris, that was great. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be rude. I'm in Dublin and I was at a dinner and anyway. Um, but I heard your whole talk, I promise, I did. Um, so actually, um, so I, 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 I'm having a little bit of, um, how should I say, I listened to your three things, you know, partition, recycling, accumulation. And I was waiting for this strange bugaboo of understanding, getting it right, that we get things, right? And I couldn't help thinking that these are all alternative ways to get that rather than trying to actually mimic us. You know, I've played with some of these large language models now um, and they're so easy to break, right? In other words, they, you can immediately expose how little they get things. Um, so I'm just trying to wonder, are you saying that these are the ingredients that lead to human understanding and generalization? Or are you, a way, are you saying this is a way to get these large, you know, when you're, you have huge data sets and you do distributional semantics and relations, that this is just a giant mimic? Or do you actually think that this is what we're doing? Yeah, I mean, I presented three viewpoints and you could probably tell from, you know, kind of the way I presented them that I was kind of arguing in favor, perhaps more of two of them than, than, than one other. I mean, I was sort of implicitly critiquing the notion that kind of undifferentiated monolithic function approximation is going to be the whole story, right? Which I think is, you know, kind of part of what you're taking aim at. But I'm going to give you a more nuanced answer to your question, right? So you talked about understanding. So I'm very interested in understanding too. But I also think that in cognitive science, you know, kind of, there's a real question around, you know, kind of what, 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 first of all, what is understanding? And secondly, what sort of quality of understanding are humans really capable of? So, you know, clever people who write papers about um, the brain and about philosophy and, you know, they, they tend to be experts in a particular domain. And my guess is that they, you know, when they think about what it means to understand, they probably reflect upon their own depth of knowledge in their specialized subject, right? But these are extraordinarily unique circumstances that is not kind of, you know, it's not, it's not the norm, right? You know, we had brains that were virtually identical for a million years when we didn't have, you know, kind of this sort of very detailed, you know, kind of ability to to understand formal systems in the way that, you know, kind of, if I asked you to explain what Bayes' theorem was and, you know, what it meant, you'd be able to do so, right? But that's because of your, it's because of the detailed cultural knowledge that you have and because of the many, many years in which you've worked in a particular domain. So cognitive science has, you know, it's really equivocated on this view. And, you know, I love this, this experiment done 20 years ago by Carl and Rosenblatt, which asks, uh, Princeton undergraduates, you know, smart um, uh, uh, students, to first of all to rate their degree of understanding of basic, you know, everyday processes. Like, you know, how well does it? How can you? How well could you describe to me how a sewing machine works? Right. 
And the Princeton undergraduates all say, you know, pretty well, you know, I, I understand that pretty well. And then the experimenters say, okay, so write it down, tell me. And they all flounder. And then they ask, okay, so now tell me, how well do you think you could explain a sewing machine? And they're all like, uh, actually, I can't really explain anything at all. And, you know, so this illusion of explanatory depth, I think, is really a pervasive aspect of our cognition. And I think that, you know, kind of in a way, understanding is the special case and the, something more superficial is the norm. Um, I just want to say one more thing, forgive me for going on, but I want to say one more response to your large language model point. So you are right, of course, large, large language models um, discourse is not yet human-like. Um, it's not yet entirely human-like. But I think that, you know, kind of people who don't work with these models have often taken the abilities, they've often misrepresented the abilities of these models. And um, they've misrepresented them in a particular way, right? So um, if I, um, let's imagine that I called someone on the telephone and um, I, and that, that person was speaking to me with a, um, a voice that you couldn't decipher. I don't know if John's still there. Um, yeah, he is. Um, a voice that you couldn't decipher. And then I handed you the phone and the person on the phone asked you a question and you had to then answer in a context appropriate way. You don't know who it is. You don't know whether it's male or female. You don't know what this person wants. You don't know what the purpose of the conversation is. And you know nothing about the background or what was being discussed immediately. You know, you would probably give some inappropriate responses too. And that is what happens when you interact with a language model zero shot, right? And I think, you know, kind of the, the use case for these models, of course, is not that it's not that use case, right? It's the use case that we have now, which is, you know, before coming to this interaction, I was prepared, I had a talk, I knew what we were going to talk about, I know a little bit about you, I can know what to expect from the audience, I have all those contextual variables. And, you know, the way that large language models will be used as tools is, of course, to fine tune them to produce context appropriate content. And when you fine tune them to produce context appropriate content, they're actually really good, really, really good. Um, so yeah, I'll stop that. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I guess when you say, for example, I mean, I love these um, illusions of explanatory depth as well. I mean, they make me laugh. Like, what? How does a helicopter work or a bicycle? And you get these absurd drawings, right? Um, but how do you give a large language model the the illusion of explanatory depth? Why doesn't it suffer from that delusion? Well, I'm how do you make a large does. language? How do you make a large language model laugh at a New Yorker cartoon? Well, yeah. So um, I think those are two different things. So first of all, you know, I wasn't, a, my, my point was that the superficiality that many people see in the interactions in natural language with large language models are actually not so dissimilar from the superficiality of our quotidian interactions with each other. That's my argument, which is that, you know, it's not that these language models are, are not flawed. Of course they're flawed, but it's we're flawed too, right? And our interactions... Yes. Right, but I, but I mean, I'm just trying to understand. Are you saying that unless you're a domain expert, we're all permanently shallow? So I think there is a really interesting case to be made for, um, for mental shallowness in, um, in human understanding. And um, that, 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 that actually... That, sh that very shallowness may well have a normative explanation. And the normative explanation that I would argue for is exactly the one that I emphasized in my talk, right? It's that the world is open-ended. You know, if the world is open-ended and permanently subject to change, it's actually not a good idea to be a domain expert, right? You, you know, will, if you, you're, you're a psychologist and you're a scientist and, you know, maybe you'll be doing that all the rest of your life, right? So it really pays to be really good at that, right? But if we lived in a world where tomorrow you could be shuffled into a new job and you had to become an airline pilot, right, then actually, I don't think it would be really all that useful to be a domain expert in anything, right? What you would need is the ability to adapt rapidly to novel circumstances. You'd need to be able to, you know, I think I, I didn't read it out, but I had on my slide, you need to be able to mentally make, do and mend, right? And this is not a new argument, right? This is just an argument for bounded rationality. But it does emphasize certain types of architecture and approaching machine learning over others. So it emphasizes, for example, um, meta-learning 
as you know, kind of a, a, a much better model of what humans do than you know, kind of um, end-to-end um, RL is all you need type approach, for example, right? And I certainly favor approaches in which you know we deliberately cut up the environment in sensible ways and do our training in this partitioned way, um, and then you know, kind of that gives us the ability to kind of learn rapidly and on the fly, which is what happens in meta learning. I certainly favor those as a model of um, of natural intelligence over, you know, kind of brute force, um, you know, world zero type approaches. New Yorker cartoon? Yes, yeah, so the New Yorker cartoon is a much more, it's an interesting one, right? So uh, I don't think that um, it's impossible that a AI system would be able to, um, to understand a New Yorker cartoon. But I think that the, um, the limit here is a data limit. So I think that, you know, kind of obviously, you know, these systems are trained for the moment on the internet, right? They're trained on approximately half a trillion tokens, which are scraped from the internet. It comes from a variety of sources. Some of them are good sources like news, so Wikipedia, some of them are less good sources like Reddit, and, you know, some of them's just general junk, right? So my view is that with language models, what actually happens is we're at a tipping point, right? So that tipping point will come when the language model is not boring for humans to use. We're just at this point now. So language models are still a bit rubbish, but you know, it's really, you can you can basically pass a reasonably interesting 10 minutes uh, chatting with Flamingo or with Chinchilla or with you know any of these dialogue systems. And when you get to this stage, that's all you need because as long as you've got lots of people who are willing to interact with these models and to devote their data and to, and to provide their data, then you're no longer bound by what you can scrape from the internet. Suddenly your data set becomes just like you, the language models start to get their data, just like we get our data, which is from interaction with others. So will they be able to, um, will, will they be able to, from that data, to understand or to, to um, it's hard not to use the word understand, will they be able to, um, to produce interactions which are human-like in ever more varied ways? Yes, I think so. Um, are there some, you know, does that mean that they are, you know, kind of really deeply understanding the ins and outs of human society? No, I don't think so. I mean, for, for apart from anything else, you know, kind of pure language models are ungrounded, right? But they're very good mimics. Yeah, but mimicking seems to be, I mean, you're just making it sound to me like if you parasitize on loads and loads of human beings thinking, you can passively mimic human beings thinking. But I thought the point you were making is you don't just want to passively mimic all the thoughts of a thousand prefront, you know, millions of prefrontal cortices doing real thinking. And then you basically, you know, cannibalize on all that thinking in a sort of brute force way, as you say, with a half a trillion parameters. And you use the word mimic. Well, that's not the same. I mean, it would be like saying, if I listen to loads and loads of people expressing what it's like to have pain during childbirth, then suddenly you also know what it's like to experience pain during childbirth. So in other words, it, it, it's like a big massive con, basically. It's not so, the real yeah. thing. And so, so I mean, mimicking means pretending. Yeah, so, that, so I didn't say that the systems would mimic our way of thinking. I said they'd mimic our actions, which is completely different, right? So I think they would mimic our outputs. And I think they're already able to a remarkable degree to mimic our outputs. So I think what you're asking is what are the limits of that? And I think that's a very good question. And I think there are limits, right? uh, important limits. So I wasn't so much asking, I'm sorry, just I wasn't so much asking limits. I'm not trying to criticize the incredibly impressive emergent behavior that these large language models are producing almost every month, right? I'm not trying to be some sort of killjoy. What I was wondering, I thought that you were trying to, I'm just wondering what they, are they basically getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more impressive uh, or are we learning anything about what understanding a New Yorker joke or feeling pain when someone insults us? Are we learning anything by transfer of how the human cognition works from these large language models? No. Or are they just basically true, true and unrelated and they're just impressive? Yeah, I don't think we are learning anything about, um, about that. I think they're just really impressive. Uh, I, sorry if I wasn't clear about that. I mean, I think, you know, kind of the... What, what, what I mean is that, you know, very soon we will be at the stage 
where you will be able to have a conversation with these models and it will feel like you're talking to another person. I can tell you it almost already does. And you know, when we have more data, it will feel like that. Now, does that mean that these models are good, you know, that they are somehow, you know, descriptions of human, the human brain and human cognition? I don't think that for a moment. And you know, kind of the reason why I don't think that is, you know, first of all, these are generative models, right? So they're trained. I mean, of course, you can fine tune them to do various things, but if you just take the base model, the base model is just trained to predict, right? So that means that it has no sense of purpose. They're not trained in an RL framework. In the RL framework, obviously, you know, you take actions purposely to influence the world to try to satisfy some value function or whatever. And you know, if you just take the model in base form as a generative model, then it has no incentive to do that. So what it lacks is our sense of motivation and our sense of purpose. And you know, you can ask really deep and interesting questions about where that, where we get that from. Where does that come from in us? Right? And those questions cut to the heart of, you know, what is the relationship between the brain as a predictive organ or a system for generative modeling and the brain as a purposeful organ or one, you know, which essentially tries to learn the value of actions and then seeks to influence the world in, in pursuit of some kind of goal or objective. And um, that's a really deep question, which I think goes, you know, is, 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 is adjacent to the question of will we build models which are bloody good? Uh, because the answer to the latter is just unequivocally yes. So at uh, the Google AI blog, you know, I, I've been following it. Um, and there's this, and I know you're not, you know, you have nothing to do with what they are saying, but they seem to be saying that some of these extra features will just emerge unexpectedly and surprisingly from having it just be a predictive generative model. So am I wrong in ascribing some people in this frame work thinking that you're going to get these odd emergent properties that do look more like cognitive you know abilities in humans that just come along for the ride that which were never expected as you added more and more parameters is that i do hear that am i wrong that some people aren't saying oh my gosh look gpt3 suddenly started multiplying three figure numbers etc cetera, etc cetera. so are you just a little bit more sober about it or is everyone denying that uh that these emergent properties are not just going to come along if you just keep going i mean you know the question of whether reward or information is the primary currency of optimization has been around for decades right and you know in neuroscience the view that you just described has its apologists as well right carl friston is the most famous one, right? so his view is that reward is a is an epiphenomenon of, of information um, maximization and information is maximized by you know communalizing surprise or free energy in a um, in in a generative modeling framework, right? Um, so of course you know within machine learning, um, you know I'm I'm not a computer scientist, right? So I probably you know I don't want to speak out of turn, but within machine learning there are communities that differentially emphasize emphasize you know the, the building of large scale predictive generative models, and those communities have just received a huge boost by the fact that you know basically the first AI we've ever built is actually fun is one of those um but you know of course there are potent communities just like there are in neuroscience that emphasize value maximization and goal seeking um over um over predictive modeling um and you know and that that is really the, the, there's a sort of within machine learning i see them as sort of two terms right now that doesn't mean there's an awful lot of people like myself who believe that you know the natural brains and presumably the brains you know if we if we wanted to emulate a natural brain by extension um that system would need to combine the merits of both of those approaches right so it would need to have a really powerful world model learned through presumably through some generative process possibly not totally dissimilar to what you know kind of powerful generative models do at the moment um but it would also need to have um you know some system for achieving goals, right? If you wanted to model a human, um, we can talk maybe later in the evening about whether we should actually do that. You know? Because, you know, despite the fact that I work at DeepMind, um, a place that is founded on the premise that we're going to build general intelligence, um, you know, speaking an entirely personal um, capacity, I have severe doubts about whether that's actually a good idea or not. 
and whether we should be pursuing that goal or not. But it's definitely true that in pursuit of that goal, um, we're going to, you know, kind of do a lot of really interesting things along the way. And, you know, those companies that have sought to achieve that goal have, um, have, have done so already. And, you know, the generative modeling and the RL are separate routes to which, you know, those, those interim goals have been achieved. Right. So I get it. Um, I, I just feel like general intelligence, tell me if I'm wrong. You know, we've had a lot of conversations on the sound about this is I always thought that once you start talking about general intelligence, the only example we have is human. So I always got the impression that general intelligence was synonymous with what humans do. And so if you say that general intelligence might come from a combination of, you know, predictive generative models and sort of motivation and reward, I, I, it sounds like to me like cobbling these together and to get general intelligence is to imply getting towards whatever it is that human beings do that's considered general intelligence? Or are you saying that there are two qualitatively distinct flavors of general intelligence? Um, I'm not sure I entirely understood the question, but I I, I can certainly answer the last um, clause, um, which is I, I do think that there are many, I certainly think there are many different types of intelligence. Um, and I think, you know, one of my favorite books, and I would encourage everyone um, you know, on this call to to read it, um, even if you're not a specialist in this field. One of my favorite books is Franz de Waal's book, Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are? Um, which is a sort of rip-roaring tour through, you know, a lot of it by anecdote, but what it does is it describes the many ways in which, you know, our sort of blinkered and anthropocentric view of intelligence has led us to assume that animals are kind of dumb when actually they're doing something really, really smart. And, you know, clearly we can have discussions about whether humans are special and clearly humans are special. Humans have language, you know, as far as we know, other systems don't have language, or we know that other systems, other um, animal systems don't have language in the same way. And that makes us special, but intelligence comes in many different flavors. And, you know, um, I think this is also a really, really important uh, point for thinking about AI. Um, you know, it's, it's another reason um, you know, you asked about the New Yorker cartoon, right? You know, I think that there are some spheres of knowledge to which, you know, we would not want artificial systems to have access. We would want to retain privileged access, right? So artificial systems, have, if we ever build an artificial system, I mean, now we're sort of talking science fiction, right? Because we're a long way away from this, right? But if we're ever to build an artificial systems, anything like a human, would we even want it to have a, a human-like body? Probably not, right? And if it doesn't have a human-like body, then, you know, it's probably going to have very different cognition to us. And that means that, you know, it might be intelligent, but it might not be intelligible, right? I think, you know, we need to build artificial intelligibility, meaning that we humans need to be able to understand it because otherwise it will just be useless and it will be unsafe, right? And, you know, the, 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 the two things which we probably don't want our artificial systems to ever do is to share our bodies or to share our social structure, right? You know, kind of we can't ever, I can't imagine a world in which, you know, kind of artificial systems are somehow, you know, part of our society. That's just, I don't know, maybe I maybe I don't read enough science fiction, but that just seems really weird. And it feels to me like there is there are domains of knowledge which you'll never really be able to kind of understand and do stuff with, like in a kind of purposeful, goal-directed RL kind of way, unless you're actually part of society and unless you have a body. So those limitations for me feel hard. And, um, you know, that's when I said that I'm not sure if building, you know, human-like intelligence, if you want, is desirable or possible. That's what I'm referring to. This is not a new idea, by the way. Um, Hubert Dreyfus, who's a, he's a sort of Gary Marcus of the 1970s, um, you know, sort of this scoriating critic of a contemporary AI, he made these points, um, you know, uh, 50 years ago, saying that if we build strong AI, it won't have our bodies, it won't live in our society, and so it will never share our true cognition. And I, I agreed with that view. Um, I, I was at an SFI meeting um, just two weeks ago, maybe less, and uh, uh, Joshua Bengio spoke. And he made it, and his whole talk was about, you know, we've solved system one, we now need to find system two. And he gave a whole talk about it, right? You know, deliberative, conscious, overt thinking. 
and you know he talked about his G flow nets and and it was kind of interesting to me listening to him that he never mentioned large language models once and I was just wondering whether these are just are you saying that this system two idea that he's such a proponent of is sort of orthogonal to what these large language models are doing um is it just the wrong barking up the wrong tree to talk about system two versus system one um i'm just trying to place in this universe of general ai human intelligence this procedural versus overt declarative version where where do you stand on this project to try and mimic system two that bengio is making such a big deal out of and how does it relate to the impressive results that we're getting with large language models a large language model is just amazing system one mimics and it's a different project or are they converging somehow well, when we think of system two we usually think of the functioning of you know kind of the prefrontal cortex and interconnected association areas right so if you have a lesion of the prefrontal cortex you don't have any difficulty producing the sorts of behaviors that gpt3 produces right so you can you can produce net fluent uh, natural language usually I mean, obviously, if the lesion is very uh, ventral, then you're going to have um, Broca's aphasia. But like, let's assume that we're in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. You're not going to have, um, you know, kind of difficulty with, you know, semantic with understanding sentences or with producing sentences, right? Um, what you do have is uh, disordered goal-directed behavior, right? So now we're in the domain of like, you know, purposeful, motivational. The system has to do stuff, right? And so, you know. Have we, you know, once again, are we able to build systems that can produce language which is a lot like humans and that can do that as sort of, we called it mimicry. And, you know, I think, you know, that, that's probably an appropriate term. Um, do we need to build systems that also, you know, kind of engage in, um, you know, kind of temporally abstract, abstracted, structured, goal-directed um, behavior based on RL or something like it? Yes, absolutely. Are we making steps towards those things? Yeah, but slowly, right? So, you know, kind of if you think of, you know, most of our, a lot of computational theories of the prefrontal cortex, they emphasize uh, things like, um, you know, kind of recurrence and attractor dynamics, or they emphasize um, uh, gating processes and fast synaptic plasticity of some sort. Um, they'll emphasize, you know, kind of various forms of, of storage and manipulation. And if you look at, you know, kind of, what's happening in um, in RL, where people building RL systems that have, um, you know, kind of LSTM-like memory, gating memory, um, you look at, um, you know, meta-learning systems, you know, what, what you are building there are systems that have, you know, kind of integrated memory and control, right? And which is, and some of them, you know, posture as theories of the prefrontal cortex, and some of them do a really good job. I mean, I love Jane Wang's uh, work on me uh, meta-control. Um, and uh, meta reinforcement learning. And, um, you know, so are these theories which might get us some other way towards system two? Uh, I think so. Are we there yet? No way. And, you know, we're a really, we're a really long way from being there, I think. Um, and, you know, kind of the kinds of debates that people are having in machine learning right now is like, you know, what's missing, right? Um, you know, I talked about my third, my third pillar, right, is this sort of idea of accumulation, right? My view is that um, I don't think, I, I, I think there is still a lot to learn from um, neuroscience and cognitive science about the structure of memory systems, and particularly about the optimal structure of memory systems conditional on the, the way the natural world happens to be organized and the way natural tasks happen to be posed. Um, and, you know, things like, you know, what are the different time courses over which uh, information becomes available and which how it needs to be stored or cached, as I said. Um, and, you know, for me, system one and system two is a little bit about that caching, right? So an automatic process is one that's cached. And then that frees up computation to deal with novelty without overwriting the cached, you know, somehow protecting the cached system. Do people in machine learning care about these things? Yes, absolutely. Do they use terms like system one and system two? 
not usually. And in fact, when they do use those terms, the very fact that they use system one and system two, which is an idiotic way of describing this distinction, a distinction which has been for 50 years and which had a terms, which had a set of terms for describing it before an economist came along and co-opted them by writing a popular science book, that speaks volumes about the level of depth with which machine learning researchers can, the, 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 the greater depth with which machine learning researchers can engage with uh, cognitive science you know there's there's volumes more for them to i think to glean from what the neurosciences and cognitive science have done i think um uh, where they hooked up an, a large language model and a robot i was just wondering whether you were to combine you know what you say sort of you know hierarchical rl plus predictive models plus a robot do you think we could get quite an interesting sort of multiplicative effect quite quickly if we were to add those all together right now, or is it too dangerous? I, I missed the first part of your question, but I, I think I understood in general what you're asking. Um, I mean, was, you, was the first part of your question referring to the uh, paper, the paper, the Gatto paper that came out yesterday? Was that what you were referring to? Yeah, I think I saw it. I was just wondering what happens when you give a body to a large language model and then maybe add some of your RL. I mean, could we sort of make a AI salad quite quickly with these different systems? Or are you implying maybe we should avoid this? Well, well that paper, what it does is it sort of, um, I mean, it sort of cheats in a way, right? Cheats in a very clever way, which is it takes a whole multiplicity of tasks, right? And then, you know, which are individually trained and it tokenizes the data and it shows that you can encode them all in one big model, right? So basically it treats lots of individual tasks solved by individual agents. I only skimmed the paper, so forgive me if this is a mis misconception. But I think they train lots of individual tasks, and then basically they show you can distill them into one big transformer model, which is not all that surprising given what we know about transformers. But I think your general question is like, you know, do we know how to hook up effectively, you know, a big generative model, a powerful generative model, a memory system, and a control system? Right, which seem to be like, you know, if you like the three, probably the three cardinal elements that we're talking about here. Exactly, exactly. Yes, yes, exactly. No. So my favorite paper that does this is actually, it's actually a deep mind paper. It's a very, it's not a very well known paper. Um, it's only on Biarchive. It's never published in a journal or as, even as far as I know in a conference, although I may be wrong about that. It's an architecture called Merlin. Uh, Greg Wayne is the first author. And they really make a very serious attempt to do this. So they use a variational autoencoder to compress and abstract uh, sensory information. And then what they do is they store the sensory information. They, they store the, the abstraction in something that's a bit like a hippocampal dependent memory. It's basically this differentiable neural computer style, like content addressable, read, write. Um, so so, so the con there's a controller that learns to read and write these abstractions to like a kind of content addressable memory. So read them and pull them out when they're needed. Um, and so that's the memory system. And then there's control on top of that. Um, I probably, you know, butchered the description, um, you know, Tim Lillicrap, who I think led that work, and Greg, who's the first author, would, of course, give you a much more detailed description. Was the model good? Yes, I think it was pretty good. But, you know, did it come anywhere close to solving the, the variety or, you know, showing the versatility of um, human goal-directed behavior, or did it come anywhere close to solving the breadth of tasks that humans can solve? No, um, nowhere near. Yeah, thank you. Honestly, it's it's just such a fascinating juncture for all of us. And um, you know, yeah. I, I hope you don't take it the wrong way. I, I I feel it's just a very interesting point where, on the one hand, as you say, we're not trying to reproduce; we're trying to mimic some of the aspects for a variety of maybe applied reasons. Um, these are parallel tracks; they're not really trying to reproduce actual human cognition, but then there are moments like that one where there's a little stab at it. So it seems like it's a Venn diagram of, you know, AI doing very impressive, flexible intelligence, human intelligence, and that overlap where there are little excursions into the overlap of that Venn diagram. And sometimes I just have difficulty knowing where in the Venn diagram we are. Do you know what I mean? It's not always clear what the project is and i found this extremely helpful to realize that it's not always an attempt to really reproduce or understand human cognition it's an attempt to mimic it for potential future applications 
that encroach minimally on our lives in terms of interpersonal relations. I mean, you know, that, that, thank you for, I mean, I really appreciate the challenges, by the way. Um, you know, the, the, the summary that you just gave there is quite aligned with my view, but, you know, there is a broad church out there and people, of course, have very, very different views. And I'm sure you will, you know, I'm sure you will and have invited onto your, um, onto this venue, uh, people who will hold completely different views, right? I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sure there are people who believe that, build, there are definitely people who believe that, um, you know, kind of building relatively monolithic architectures with enough data is going to give you human-like, um, you know, human-like cognition as well as behavior. Um, that's certainly true. But I, yeah, I do, I do make this distinction between um, solving specific problems and then the, you know, the really big problem, the really big question, which I think is still a question. I do actually, I'm cheating. Ida's going to get annoyed at me, but I must ask you, is it true that you, what's your book called and when's it coming out? Oh, you just announced that. The, that, that that's the secret. Oh, I'm sorry. Should I not have done that? <laughs> that's all right. I, it's, it's, um, I've written a book. It's called Natural General Intelligence and it's going to be out in, um, at the end of the year. Um, so it's about, about the and it's going to touch on this. Yeah, so, um, well, wow, that's really exciting, really exciting. I am very excited about it. And, uh, I hope I, did, I, I, I don't think I learned it from some other source. I hope I have, you're not going to kill me if I haven't mentioned it. So. <laughs> no, it's absolutely fine. It's absolutely fine. I just, um, okay. I, ha I haven't yet uh, publicized it, but I guess now I have. So there we are. <laughs> well, you know, you, you have to understand the learning salon will just be huge fans. So I hope you take it in the positive Thank you. Sense. Thank you for, thank you for the plug. All right. <laughs> thank All you right. for spilling the tea, John, <laughs> <right>. over there. <laughs> So this, this was a fantastic conversation, uh, especially since, as John knows very well, first of all, I'm very much on the side of we're not, no, we're not in any danger because of the fact that AI is going to be like us. We're more in danger of how it's used in a society. And it is already in, in socialized within us, but not with a, the kind of human-like socialization skills. It's just integrated into our policies to be used, uh, face detection, various kinds of decisions being made by it. It's observing us and it's not even it, it's just like a lot of different little AIs. It's not even one big AI singular that people talk about. Uh, it was a fantastic um, uh, reminder also that uh, computer scientists sometimes really use the terms that we use in very generous ways and it creates a lot of trouble. And I have had a lot of heated discussions with some machine learning and RL people who would use a term like, oh, we achieved compositionality. I'm like, no, you didn't. What are you talking about? Or system two, like you were saying. Um, so I really appreciate that you said that. Another thing that I wanted to kind of maybe summarize or remind people who might have joined a little later is that uh, some of the items you were mentioning in your talk was that people are uh, also, they fail at transfer at times. Uh, people are good at factorization, however, and uh, they're lear and that uh, human learning is cumulative, which relates to the last conversation that we had, which was cumulative culture in um, uh, hunter gatherers. And then you mentioned the relationship of all of this to lifelong learning of the three principles that you had, and also. Um, the role of narrative in the way that we share and store human knowledge in the cumulative way, and that was really lovely. So I just wanted to just hit the summaries for anybody who just joined us a little later and didn't see your great talk about partitioning, accumulation, and recycling, the three components you talked about. Um, something that I uh, found maybe it's a little on the side of doing things with words as opposed to maybe um, something that I would consider um, hard evidence was this idea that, for instance, the Princeton grad student that you mentioned, that there could be a feeling of knowing the process without actually knowing. To be fair, a Princeton undergrad is the person who might think they know a lot more <laughs> about the world than they actually do. So I, I'm a little concerned about that study or that example because of the particular, um, you know, even the stereotype of an undergrad anywhere and let alone at Princeton. So I just wanted to say, I think maybe when it comes to uh, setting a bar, it's not necessarily just failures or even average failures, but actually what's achievable with uh, human, human brains or human-like algorithms, so to speak. 
And so in that, maybe I'm less on the side of where does it come apart or where do we fail or where do we have the wrong kind of feeling of knowing, but maybe more on where do humans do the kinds of transfer that AI is still not capable of doing or still not even addressing it, for instance, right? And um, I don't think towards that, and you were mentioning maybe we will never have uh, general intelligence, and I'm actually with you. I'm on the free, no free lunch theorem side. I don't think that we're going to have um, that necessarily, but towards human-like intelligence, even in a subset of tasks, let's say we define a battery of prefrontally related tasks and we expect that um, AI would be able to perform them in a human-like way, meaning it would show the accuracies, reaction times, and errors similar to humans, for instance. And we also look inside the hood, under the hood, inside the brain of humans, and make sure that the representation relations inside the AI is similar, for instance. Um, the challenge that I have with some of perhaps uh, DeepMind approaches uh, to this is this idea of just scaling or even the kind of uh, methods that John is mentioning, like GPT-3, like uh, Palm, um, is it works through very large scale training, which is not human like at all so far, many of the approaches. And therefore, even if they manage, as you were saying, to mimic or imitate some behavior, a as Kate Crawford in our uh, one of our the, um, one of our early salon sessions was saying in her book Atlas of AI, it's extremely catastrophic for the environment. The amount of training that we are, the amount of carbon footprint of all of these uh, uh, models, for instance, uh, one GP training one GPT three model um, uses up as much carbon footprint as five cars in their lifetime. And I don't even remember how many crazy number of flights between um, the, the US and the uh, East Asia. Um, that's one thing. So I have an issue with challenges uh, or uh, I have challenges with approaches to achieving this kind of human like performance, even in just behavior that uh, rely on very large, massive energy inefficient scaling of simple processes. And uh, speaking of the question that John was asking, it's basically, um, it's not system one all the way down. It's basically, they're, they're trying to say, we can get capture human intelligence and to use a very bad term, and I agree with you, it's not very well uh, posed, um, but that it's always uh, uh, basically just very simple associations all the way down. Uh, just you need to scale it up. But the truth is you and I were not trained on millions of texts in order to learn any of the languages that we know. So uh, I want to ask you your position on the scaled approach to human like AI or RL versus the maybe I would call it a, a PFC approach, which would be, hey, you need to have an algorithm that allows for uh, recurrence, um, fast synaptic plasticity, uh, memory and manipulation and various kinds of operations. Um, at a higher level of abstraction than lower level regions. For instance, not at the pic all the pixels, but at the objects that somebody else parsed in the ventral, not somebody, some other parts of the cortex um, parsed in ventral uh, temporal areas and then passed it on and then it got broadcasted. And then now the PFC is working with this object on, put this object on top of this other object or trying something so that we take out language. Let's say it wants to figure out a solution to a problem the animal that we are considering. In that case, there would be a particular hierarchy of architecture that our algorithm needs to satisfy in order for it to be doing it the way humans do it. So not just in imitating behavior by training billions of uh, corpus of different kind of experiences or texts, but by having structural components in the architecture, however we want to make it happen or representation learning approaches that allow for this kind of, um, I would like to say maybe top down, I don't know how to say it, but it's architecture driven as opposed to scale driven, so to speak. Uh, so I, I would think based on knowing your work since I was in grad school uh, uh, on PFC that you would be more um, uh, on the side of uh, better architecture as opposed to just scaling as in like, you know, uh, not turtles all the way down, but system one all the way down kind of approach. Um, but I really want to hear what you think of that, the wastefulness uh, of these scaled models um, 
in contrast to uh, the principled approach to um, having human like cognition that would be in a kind of PFC like architecture. Sorry, I talked too long, but. <laughs> no, it's fine. That's a really nicely um, articulated question. And yeah, I think I can. I think I kind of grasped what you were saying. So I want to begin by talking about, I mean, I think that, you know, kind of when you're talking about scale, you talked about two vices, right? So one is like, one is basically a moral problem, which is about, you know, the sort of, you know, kind of untrammeled use of a limited uh, um, um, planetary resource, right? Um, and, you know, I think, you know, that is a that is a, that is an issue which we all have to grapple with. And it's not just, you know, of course, you know, the, the Training of large models is one contributor to that. And I think, you know, um, there are many ways. I'll talk a bit in a second about, um, you know, kind of why I think the opportunities are um, to, to downscale. But at the moment, I think it's fair to say that just like in so many other walks of life, our use of those resources is incredibly wasteful and needlessly wasteful, in fact. Um, but I think, you know, beyond that question, you're you're asking, you know, you're you're asking a broader question. And that is that, you know, kind of, so here's how I would put the question, right? So um, life, um, you know, we, we, we um, life has the property that no two experiences and no two moments are ever the same, right? So everything is always different, right? It's like, you know, Heraclitus says, right? No man ever steps in the same river twice, right? That's, that is our experience of the natural world, right? And what that means is that every single problem we encounter is a generalization problem, right? There is no problem that we ever encounter in life. We can just naively recycle what we've done before because nothing is ever exactly like it was before. Right? And because everything in life is a generalization problem, we know from theory that there are basically two solutions to solving a generalization problem. Right? If you want to, if you want to generalize well, you've got to do one of two things. One, you've got to learn an absolutely mass massive distribution, right? So that the new samples that you get you can essentially interpolate. So essentially in distribution, right? Or two, you've got to impose constraints, right? And those constraints have to be tailored to meet the particular problem that you're going to encounter, right? So the natural world is full of natural tasks and natural tasks are not random. And the natural world is not random. So natural world has some structural properties. It exists, there is such a thing as space, and space has some properties, right? You know, it has, you know, if two spots are close to each other, then it's quicker to get from one to the other than, um, you know, kind of it is to get to one further away. That's a really non accident. The world doesn't have to be like that, but it is like that. You know, time goes forward, time does not have the property that space has, right? So, you know, I can, as an agent, I can move around in space, I can't move around in time, right? These are non accidental properties. Right? Um, tasks have specific properties too, right? Um, those properties are often given by the way that information unfolds over time. So I like to say that the world is sort of smooth with exceptions, right? So most, most bits of the world are quite like other bits of the world that they're close to in space or time. But there are exceptions, right? You know, when you go through a doorway out of your house, boom, everything's different. It doesn't look like the rest of your hallway, which all looks a bit like itself, right? And so the tasks that we do need to account for all of these factors, right? You know, if you think about your classic example, why do we need episodic memory? Well, it's because, you know, you go once to the watering hole and there's a nasty lion there and it nearly eats you. So next time you need to remember, don't go to the watering hole at 6 p.m. on a Saturday because that's when the lion goes to drink, right? And so, you know, that's, that's the exception that is not smooth, right? And so, you know, the world has these properties and the cognitive systems that we have evolved are tailored to solving these properties. And that's why the brain is not just a massive neural network made of transformers or anything else. That's why we have a hippocampus. It's why you know different bits of the brain clearly do different things. And we know that because if you remove them, you have different patterns of deficit, right? Um, and you know that that modular structure, which is you know kind of psychology one hundred one, neuroscience one hundred one, right? It's what you learn the first time you rock up as an undergraduate. You learn that different bits of the brain do different things um, with caveats. Um, you know what that means is that evolution has given us constraints, right? And those constraints are, in my view, neatly tailored to the problems that exist in the natural world. And you know, one of the most important ones, I think, you know, re really critical ones are about space and time. And that was the point I was trying to get across about transformers. Like transformers are really cool, right? Transformers, 
Transformers turn time into space, which is like a really, really clever thing to do. And in doing so, what they essentially allow you to do is like, you know, within a short interval, sort of hop around in time and understand relations in time, much as we understand, you know, relations between two objects in space. And I think that's one thing that gives them their power. You know, are biological systems like Transformers? Maybe, you know, I love the ideas that are emerging, that maybe they are, but maybe they're wrong, I don't know. Um, but it's an example of a, you know, that's an, that, that there are examples of constraints which are tailored to deal with the problems that we have in the real world. And when I said we don't think enough about memory systems, that was a particular appeal to, you know, the world has, um, the me memory systems have evolved to deal with the way information is, the relevance of information to behavior is organized in time. And we've built, you know, we started by, um, you know, building systems that were like, okay, we need to share information across time points, right? So we built recurrent networks. It's very clever. But then we realized that actually it's not just kind of monolithic information sharing. Sometimes information you kind of need to put it in your pocket for a while and pull it out again a little bit later. So we built LSTMs, which have gating, right? And now we've built transformers. Um, so where am I, to answer your question, where am I on this sort of scale versus constraints? You know, I don't really think that there is a good answer to this question, right? And I think that, you know, kind of the, the so-called debates, you know, kind of about, you know, is this really, we need strong inductive biases or we need no inductive biases. I think this is just nonsense, right? What we need is the right inductive biases for the problem we're going to solve, right? If the problem you want to solve is the natural world, you probably need a lot of inductive biases that look an awful lot like what we evolved in evolution. If your problem is something different, like solving Go, then you need very different inductive biases, or maybe very few inductive biases at all, as Dave Silver is fond of reminding us. And, you know, I think that this is just a non-question about, you know, should we have one or should we have the other? You just need as much as much as you can, right? You know, the right, the right uh, constraints. And just one tiny thing to say more about scale. I mean, you know, I do take your point, you know, clearly biological systems are vastly more sample efficient than um, uh, current AI systems. But I think, you know, these so-called foundation models are also, one of, the, one of the reasons that I like them is that they're alerting, I think what they're doing is they're introducing into AI a way of thinking about learning and cognition, which is more familiar from psychology and neuroscience, which is that, you know, kind of what actually goes on when you actually study learning or cognition in the lab, particularly learning in the lab, right? And a lot of what we do in everyday life, it's not like you're learning something from scratch, right? All of our learning is layered upon old learning, right? And so it's not really fair to say, okay, we need to train this network from zero, right? Because clearly zero was like, you know, maybe zero was when you were born or maybe zero was when we were still in the primeval soup, right? Um, so what is fair? Well, it's to say, well, you need as much training, you know, kind of relative to the start starting point of having a sort of solid foundation of sort of understanding something about the world, like, you know, your undergraduate subjects participants do when they come to do an experiment in your lab. And of course, the model that we're moving towards with large transformer based models is foundation and fine tuning, right? So as a foundation, which is trained on like, you know, the whole internet, and that's, you know, kind of reasonably stable, although your fine tuning will penetrate some of the layers of that. But then really what you study, what you really do is you fine tune it. And that fine tuning is, of course, vastly more sample efficient. And I think to cycle back to the environmental issues, you know, I hope that we're moving towards a place in which there'll be sort of, you know, larger, more stable models. And what we can do is we can learn how to fine tune them appropriately. Thank you for that. Um, I like that you said um, we need to have the right inductive biases for the problems that we are trying to solve. I think that that was very helpful. And I also think um, there is, however, a potential, um, I feel like there is a emergent side discipline which is doing neuroscience on neural network models, which because uh, the term that you used earlier that I really liked, AI intelligibility, is you know something that we are lacking. And um, I think it would be a little of a slippery slope. Um, and the term that I would use, and we actually are going to do a project with this with Kate Crawford, my colleague who has um, critical theory and philosophy background. 
there would be like there we we have this feedback loops back from ml into cognitive neuroscience and we had these turns over the years we had the behaviorist turn in animal learning and we had kind of a inspiration by of that led to machine learning but then there was the cognitive turn with tolman and then representation learning and latent learning in machines also became more sophisticated um, however uh, some economists maintain some of the behaviorism. Some models, because they were based on this economic theory, they maintain that behaviorism. Some machine learning approaches are very behaviorist-like. Some of them are a little bit more on the kind of the cognitive turn. And then there was the third uh, wave in cognitive science, which was embodiment. And then robotics in um, um, AI, they have that kind of a turn a little bit where um, it's not exactly one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, at least it kind of gets closer to that. Uh, one challenge, however, is that after the 20th century, uh, I would say that the models from AI and machine learning are feeding back into our models of how human intelligence or animal intelligence works. In fact, my entire career has been based on testing out different models that were proposed in reinforcement learning and showing, hey, this one doesn't act like humans. This one is a little bit more like humans. This one, I need to add this component to it in order for it to behave like humans. And then let's look at the brain. Actually, these ones don't capture what's in the brain, although we theorized it. But what about this one? Um, so here is the worry that I have uh, with just going too far into that approach of um, building MLs that use a different approach with a lot of scaling, with a lot of fine tuning and very little, uh, I guess, um, interest in more uh, efficiency like humans or like other animals. My worry is the, the kind of machinization of our models of human intelligence or uh, natural intelligence that is already happening. It's this return of this behaviorist ghost um, that has been implanted into the history of machine learning uh, now taking a, another shape of being this kind of like uh, uh, sort of uh, um, scaled uh, <laughs> ghost of just it's all about imitation it's all like you know input output and a very simple system that just iterates in the middle i worry a little bit about what it does to cognitive neuroscience also so it is one thing that we do success of science for tech which is, you know, uh, uh, makes a lot of money for tech. Therefore, they're, they're very interested in it. It's another thing for us who are in between, who are using that wave in order to study how brains work, really, and how humans work, and how to build better models of prefrontal cortex for better understanding. And to the potential um, danger of mixing the two so much that our view of human humans basically is completely diminished and the, our theories of uh, psychology don't advance the way they should because they're sort of trying to mimic too much the other way that they're trying to find ways uh, for their brain analysis to mimic this uh, uh, particular neural network or this particular yeah. machine learning so I wonder what you think of this potential echo that might change our view of what it is to have a mind and what it is to have intelligence and keep shrinking it down to fit with that idea of what ML does. Hey, you know, machines are not good at transfer. We're not that good at transfer either. Oh, you know, machines are not good at this. Well, we're not that good at that either. Maybe gradually we start unintentionally to reduce human minds to something that fits within a particular set of models and I wonder what you think of that. I, I wonder whether, at least for those of us, obviously machine learning people, some of them can say, I don't care. And it's understandable. They're just, their goals are different than us. But for those of us who are at this intersection, we're very much at this intersection. We actually care that our models behave and are neurally a little bit like human brains and that they behave like humans. For instance, some of yes. us, you and me. So in that case, I wonder what you think of the potential dangers of not paying close attention to um, this feedback loop that is yeah. coming back. Yeah, I mean, you know, what, uh, the, the, a few points to make. I mean, the first one is, you know, kind of, um, you know, th thanks for providing, you know, you, you, you introduced a kind of potted history of like, you know, kind of the various movements, which, um, you know, kind of psychology and neuroscience have gone through, um, you know, from behaviorism and there's connectionism and cognitivism and there's Bayesianism as well. And then we have the return to our, you know, Behavior. We had the RL revolution, right, which was sort of 
behaviorism 2.0 or whatever, except with model based as well now. Um, and you know, at each step of the way, there's been a really tight synergy between the movements that are happening in computer science and AI research or machine learning latterly, and what happened in psychology. And you know, you can chart those relations. They they go back to the 1960s or 50s even. Um, and you know, I mean, people like Herb Simon, who you know, kind of you know, is the was the embodiment of like you know, kind of the symbolic AI movement, who is of course you know also the key figure of, you know, kind of in cognition and this is really emblematic of that synergy to me and, you know, kind of figures, you know, TD learning was originally developed um, as a theory of, you know, to explain conditioning, right, to explain the basic effects in, in animal conditioning. So, I mean, you know, the synergy has been there all the way through. So the question is, you know, what's the risk? And I think what you've highlighted is a particular um, phenomenon, which, you know, is about four or five years old now, whereby, and it's been advocated by some people, including people who I have enormous uh, intellectual respect for. Um, and it's basically, it's sort of, my, in my view, what's happened is that neuroscientists have been somewhat beguiled by the promise of sort of powerful monolithic processing that you see in machine learning, right? So basically deep networks in particular, you know, kind of relatively unrestricted architectures like convolutional ne neural networks seem to do well on certain classes of problem, you know, and um, the argument is, and because these these architectures are relatively unrestricted, right? They're relatively few constraints, and of course, because you know there is there's always a pull towards reducing your inductive biases in machine learning. The idea has got imported into neuroscience, right? And you know, the sorts of papers that have tried to make this point are like Uri Hassan's article, "Direct Fit to Nature," in Neuron a couple of years ago, which you know basically argues that there's a risk that our sort of hard fought structured theories of computation are sort of like just so stories that we have read into the data. We have limited data, we have poor decoding methods. And so this gives us noisy and partial purview on what's actually happening in the brain. And what we're doing is we're using our very human capacity to tell stories. And we've told really elaborate stories about structured computation and we've spun them up into kind of, you know, grand theoretical edifices. But actually, if you look under the head, there's just neurons, there's just entangled connections, and, you know, the brain just sort of magically sorts it out. And, you know, I don't agree with that view. Um, I don't agree with it. I think, you know, as I said before, um, it might work reasonably well within a brain region. You know, if you think, particularly think about neocortex, right? Neocortex has a repeating um, algorithmic motif, which is the canonical microcircuit, and that repeats across, and the primate cross um, uh, six-layer cortex and uh, neocortex. Um, so, you know, no doubt there are shared principles, right? But it's also true that, you know, um, biological systems all have like, you know, phylogenetically ancient structures like a basal ganglia, like a hippocampus, both of which are like 400 million years old or more, right? Um, and they also have stereotyped patterns of connectivity. And this is not just talking about humans, right? This is the, this is the mammalian brain in general. Um, we have stereotyped patterns of um, of connectivity. Um, we have, you know, clearly um, overt representations of egocentric and allocentric space with differential weighting in the primate and the rodent, right? Monkeys, like us, uh, tend to care a lot about egocentric space because we like pick things up a lot. Um, and uh, uh, rodents tend to care a lot about um, allocentric space because they mostly scurry around. Um, and, you know, I think that um, these, these, this structure in computation, it's not a just so story. I think it's real. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think there is, an, there is an argument to be had. Um, and I, I enjoyed and appreciated very much both Barry's paper and also um, uh, Blake Richard's paper on the, the deep learning framework, which makes a sort of similar argument, although in a slightly more subtle way, I think. But broadly, I think that you know what they do is they they emphasize monolithic computation and de-emphasize the the structure which is there in biological systems. But I just want to say one more thing in defense of like you know kind of using neural networks models as theories for biology, and that is that we have no choice. We have to use these models, and the reason we have to use these models is because they are the only theories that we have of representation learning. Every other computational model you build for the brain, you have to stick the states in by hand, right? So you have to cheat. I mean, you know, 
cheat. It's cheating for machine learning. But, you know, you have to make an assumption about what the states in the system are. The only class of model in which they can be learned autonomously from the data are connectionist models. And so we need, we cannot do without connectionist models if we want to understand representation learning. And, you know, as we said, sort of one half, if you think, you know, my argument essentially is that, you know, we, the two really big problems or three really big problems the brain has to solve, but one of them is like, you know, can we learn a big, a, a big model of the world, right? And if we want to study that process, we need systems that can learn a model of the world. Um, and those are neural networks and we can't do without them. Yeah, I agree with you. So the concern is more on the side of doing analysis or doing neuroscience like methods on these neural networks to even understand what they're doing is doing feedback already into how we are interpreting brain data. And I think that's the part where it becomes problematic that uh, it's, it's one thing to say, we don't have a choice. This is the, our limited model of the world. It's another one to so much believe in them that assume that all the brains are doing are really this, like this is our new theory. I think that's the part where I get a little worried because I think the, I, obviously the feedback loop makes sense of testing a theory, neural networks, and then applying back, but it might actually limit what kinds of architecture we are considering in the brain if we constantly go from that direction, from the direction yeah. of um, machine learning into brains. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, kind of this speaks to, there's a, there's a whole new field being developed around trying to understand, you know, how do we actually use these tools as models for, new, for, for neural behavior and also for longitudinal learning as well, right? And there, there, are, there are challenges there that are really, you know, there are technical challenges, right? If I fit an RL model to data, I can basically like, I can basically teach a faucet, right? So what I can do is I can re-tether it on each time step to the actual choices that participants made so that, you know, kind of, I, you know, it's not spiraling off into some weird, you know, kind of behavior or unrolled into some weird behavior, right? But with a neural network, you can't do that, right? It's, it's initialized to random. So you, you, you can't tether it to human data. So your, your comparisons have to be at the qualitative level. You know, how the hell do you do maximum likelihood estimation? These are all really challenging questions. And, you know, in my empirical papers, we've cooked up some tools for trying to address these challenges. Other people have too, but it's very much open, I think. Thank you so much. I could ask a million other questions, but I invited some of our audience members that had uh, questions asked in the question area and uh, they were highly voted and they were available to uh, appear on screen so that we can have a little bit more of a dialogue with others. Um, I think in the order of the questions, John Kubi was first. Please go ahead. Hi, John. Um, uh, can you hear me? Okay, uh, so two quick questions. One is you used the word context and I'm interested, you used it quickly early. How, um, I'm very interested in that. And I, I think contexts have to be both fairly rigid but flexible. They can't be completely rigid or else you can't generalize out sort of say a specific spatial domain or something like that. But if they're too flexible, they're no longer a context. Uh, at least that's my way of thinking. Um, could you comment on that? I mean, I agree with you. You know, context is one of these sort of dramatically overused words in our field, right? It means a million different things in different areas. And so, you know, obviously it's good to be precise. Um, you know, we tend to think, you know, information processing approach has always said, you know, kind of there's a stimulus and there's a response, right? And the stimulus drives the response and everything else is context, right? Um, and that context can mean, you know, in the context of neuroscience is other information which is unavailable, you know, it's outside of the receptive field of that neuron, or it occurred at a different time period to the stimulus, um, you know, or it can mean much broader things about, you know, kind of, am I, you know, at, at the moment, I'm in a particular context, which is like giving a talk on the internet, but I could be in a different context, which would be like, you know, being on the beach, um, that would be a different context too. How the brain handles that is, you know, I think what you're rightly alluding to is like a really it's a really thorny challenge. I think we know a little bit about how the brain does that. It seems to involve parts of the prefrontal cortex that integrate information over time and are critically involved in control. Some of those are on the medial wall, like the anterior cingulate cortex. Um, it's clearly very, very involved in trying to understand, for example, when we sort of switch between contexts. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think your question really highlights the fact that this is something that we, we don't very, Careful. We don't have very well pinned down either theoretically or semantically. Well, I'm thinking of it in my specific area is hippocampus and mapping and 
And I think that to, to me, that lays out a very concrete uh, hypothesis about what a context is, what mapping and remapping and that kind of thing. I, I presume in, in primates, it's sort of transferred to prefrontal cortex where it's a little harder to be um, so specific of what's meant. But uh, yeah. that, Although even in the remapping, re remapping literature, people use context completely differently, right? So some people say that the context changes if you put the box in a new room. Some people say the context changes if you change the odor or the textures on the walls, for example. And some people say the context changes if you change the task that the animal is doing, like foraging in one direction or foraging in the other. Right. All of those provoke, produce partial remapping, right? Is that because the brain is sensitive to those three different types of context or is it because all of those, like Sam Gershman has argued, um, uh, you know, is that because they're all the same sort of context and they're just basically different forms of latent state inference? You know, I think in each of these domains, we use context in a, in a quite a different way. Yeah, my reading is that the context are a little more rigid than the remapping to every little change in the environment. That's, I think, the critical question for using that. Um, the other um, thing, I wasn't quite sure what you're saying is the what evolution teaches us and you know one area that I think a lot about and come to no conclusions is the evolution of neocortex in mammals what problems it how is it organized what's it solving there's really nothing like it in um, reptiles or the preserve mm -hmm. presume ancestors of mammals yeah that's a, that so that question's above my pay grade so you know first of all I really you know I'm really quite quite ignorant of like you know kind of cognitive or cognitive evolution or brain evolution. I don't, I don't know a lot about it. I wish I knew more. Um, you know, my understanding, my, my, my sort of naive psychology 101 understanding is that, you know, kind of evolution provides, you know, reasonably stereotyped pathways for connectivity, right, which shape the way that res representational properties, receptive field properties um, can be in interaction with the environment can be formed, right? And, you know, um, debates about the extent to which, you know, kind of, you know, whole functions like causal inference or theory of mind or face perception or these things are, you know, sort of given by evolution rather than learning. I really, I don't feel qualified to um, to comment very, very well on those. But, you know, my, my understanding is that, you know, most people believe that we come into this world um, with, you know, something that's definitely not a blank slate and that that should be part of the considerations that we entertain when we're thinking about modeling, um, you know, modeling representation learning from scratch, for example. So I'm not sure I heard you right. We were saying some people call these evolutionary just those stories, but you think the constraints, is, it is a good way to look at it, although we don't understand it too well. Well, the just so stories, I think, were a reference to the fact that when we decode information in neural recording experiments, you know, we have to make sense of that data. And even if that data were just fundamentally incomprehensible, because all neural processing is like nonlinear, deeply entangled, and you know, um, and high dimensional, right? Even if that were the case, maybe we would still make up a story about it, and just so we can write a paper. I think that was the point being made, and you know, no doubt that is true. <laughs> but I think that doesn't mean that you know. For example, in the, the case in point of rodent medial, medial temporal lobe, you know, that for me is like the paradigmatic example of where we have used a combination of experimentation and theory to understand how computation is structured. And, you know, it's, it's for me the go-to model of, you know, how neuroscience should be done. I think we, you know, we, there's been a, tr a tremendous focus on, um, you know, idea generation and really careful, careful experimentation and the fruit of that is, you know, a, a really good understanding of how a computational system works. And, you know, surprise, surprise, um, the first Nobel Prize that um, systems neuroscience has had in a while, right? So, yeah. I think you'll get a counter argument from John Beckauer, but I'll <laughs> pause there. John has been having connection issues, so I don't know if we heard <laughs> all of that, but I want to highlight what Tim Barron said in, the, oh, yep, there it is. I want to highlight what Tim Barron said in the chat. Uh, surely the distinction between John's hippocampal context and Chris's PFC is not rodent vs primate. It's just a difference between episodic and consolidated memory, no? If you get it from generalization, you need PFC. If you get it from memory, you can do it with hippocampus. What do we think of Tim's summary? I have to think about it. <laughs> Tim, I don't understand your point. 
<laughs> we, we're gonna invite him if he's still around uh once we have one person off the uh screen because the maximum is six i uh, can go yeah. oh no or you can stay and somebody else can ask their question so we can have you uh while the uh, tim joins <laughs> um harrison do you want to uh, or mihai were you the next uh yeah mihai do you want to go next uh I think Harrison was saying that he needs to go in a bit, so uh, I'm happy for him to, to go first. My friend will wait, it's okay. Okay, sure. Uh, so th thanks a lot for the talk. It's a really interesting discussion. Um, I was wondering about uh, these uh, three pillars of sort of knowledge accumulation or uh, cognition, so uh, partitioning, recycling, and, uh, and accumulation. At, at what level? Do they start to arise? Do we find them in kind of unicellular organisms? Do we have more more complex systems? Um, maybe well, what are the criteria for for a system to have each of these? Um, and do they kind of all arise together in a system, or um, would you have you know like I, I could easily imagine a very inefficient system where there's just a lot of knowledge accumulation without partitioning and recycling, yeah. uh, there would be some limitations there, obviously. Um, but well, how, how do we think of this, I guess, is, is my Yeah, that's, that's a really super question, right? So I pose these as sort of high-level approaches to understanding natural intelligence. But at the same time, you know, kind of I didn't sort of say, oh, this is what one bit of the brain does, or some animals do this, and so on. So what, what, well, what is the mapping? And I guess, you know, I think of these as very, very broad principles that play out, you know, right down from you know a cellular to a systems level right if you think of partitioning what does partitioning really mean right partitioning is like a discretization operation right what it means is that bits of information are not going to be universally shared across a um a network a processing system but rather they're going to be locally processed right and you can think of all sorts of ways if you think of you know just kind of like at the level of simple circuits you know attractor dynamics give you forms of discretization Right. What they do is they say, you know, kind of it's, de you know, I'm definitely coding this thing and I'm in some state and you've got to work quite hard to push me out of that state. Right. You know, that's, you know, kind of and that's why we have, you know, we, we have models of things like biostability, which is like a sort of paradigmatic behavioral example of, you know, how we discretize the world. Right. Multi-stability. You know, we have theories of multi-stability that rely on things like, you know, attractor dynamics, for example. Right. That's just one example. Um, you know, discretization might play out at much at, a, at much broader levels, right? I mean, you know, when we think about language or we think about the contents of working memory, right? You know, kind of people are fond of saying that working memory limits on working memory are sort of cardinal, right? They're, they're, they're given by bounds on the number of different objects which can be um, maintained. Now, of course, that's a contested view. My colleague Masood Hussain at uh, Oxford would uh, tell you something different. But you know, that's an idea. That that's an example of where we sort of partition the world. And in terms of continual learning, um, you know, we've in empirical work thought quite a lot about. You know, it, it feels like the sort of there are many flavors of solution to continual learning, but there's one flavor of solution which is like sort of chop things up by context. This goes back to John's question, right? So, you know, if we can chop things up by context, if I can learn about beach things in the beach in one context and learn about, you know, work things in another context, then I don't mistakenly wear my swimming trunks to give a, um, a lecture, right? And that would be a good thing, right? So I could partition in that way, but then the maybe softer forms, you know, and, and most of what's been proposed in machine learning are softer forms of adjustment, whereby weights are sort of weights are changed to gradually accommodate new learning continually rather than forming hard partitions. Right. So that's an example. Partitioning could play out at the level of, you know, kind of really local circuits or big systems. I won't go on, but I would make similar sorts of arguments for the other two processes that I referred to. Well, as you were speaking, I was thinking that um, you could probably apply this to DNA as well and evolution. Yeah, I don't know anything about evolution, so I would love it if someone else <laughs> wanted to develop that argument. Well, I, I think I, I know even less, but are you saying that um, in a good system, these are sort of self-balancing um, elements such that, or, or maybe I can ask the question, as to what happens if there is an imbalance between these uh, in a system? If for, for some reason 
um, you a, a system maybe starts to recycle too much and reuse the same knowledge, uh, but not in the appropriate context or not partition things well, or starts just accumulating things, but not appropriately partitioning that accumulation yeah. or, or recycling things up. I think I wasn't really sort of trying to think, you know, kind of we should do away with memory, attention, language, and perception and replace them with these three terms that I just made up. I don't think they're, they're substitutes for cognitive process. I think what they are are general approaches for thinking about ways in which computation solves the sorts of problems that the natural world throws up. So they could apply in a really cross-cutting way. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's really about three systems that need to be in balance. They're just general principles, which you can, they're, they're like, if you like theoretical tools, very, very general theoretical tools, which you could use to understand what's special about the way in which, you know, cognition of humans and other primates in particular plays out, um, maybe relative to existing, maybe relative to current AI systems, or maybe even relative to some simpler um, organisms or whatever. But I think I understand what Nihai is getting at. He's saying, imagine an algorithm or a species that really maximized, uh, let's say, partitioning, but didn't care much about accumulation, then what do you get versus if an, another set of algorithms are maximizing recycling, but not as much, let's say, something else. Like they have some interdependencies, but um, I think what he's asking is interesting. It's almost like he's thinking of different species of algorithms that can emerge from different balances between the three yeah. principles you're talking about. And he's wondering whether these three principles can be inferred from the evolution of different species, because as you were saying, phylogenetically, some of the partitions in the brain or modules in the brain are more ancient than others. Um, is, am I getting you correctly, Mihai? That's um, so, sort of, so th that's part of it. And then uh, th there's also a question of, are these things that we should sort of explicitly try to model and introduce into our models, or are these things that uh, will somehow arise through other processes and we can analyze. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I guess I don't know the answer. I really appreciate your clarification. I mean, that does give me a way of thinking about it, right? So, you know, I guess the point that I was trying to make is that, you know, in certain types of, for certain types of problem, certain types of solution might, might be privileged, right? And so when I, you know, I made the point that like, you know, many monolithic deep learning architectures, what they're essentially trying to do is learn a big conditional distribution. And, you know, that is very, that that's very useful as long as you don't have a sort of, you know, kind of, dist, you know, dramatic distributional shift in the in the generative process, right? In the, in the way the world works, right? Or the new context that you encounter. And so in a setting where what you want to do is solve a relatively homogenous problem, then you probably don't need um, I would argue, you know, really explicit forms of um, of composition, depending on what the problem is, right? And maybe certain certain very these elements will be a response to certain problems that you get in the natural world. You know, like um, you know, organisms need to learn over long periods of time, and information can get lost. And so, having you know, being able to cache and then reuse might be a useful way to solve that. But in a machine learning context, or in when we try to build models, are these tools for analyzing our models, or are these tools for building sort of biases into our yeah, models? Yeah, high-level principles for thinking about, you know, high-level principles for thinking about the sorts of biases that we ought to build. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much for Thank that, Mihai. That helped us Thank understand you. it a little more clearly as well. Thank you so much, uh, John Krakauer. You wanted to ask something urgently. Oh, you're muted. I'm now on. I muted you. Oh, you muted yourself. Okay, now you're ah, on. Okay, uh, Chris, I, I have to go, but I just wanted to, I just wanted to get a clarification just for me. Forgive me if it's a dumb question. Um, you said three things, and I just want to understand them. One, you said that, yeah, you're not really into these, you, the Yuri Hassan argument of direct fit, these end-to-end -end models, but we need them because they give us some insight into representations, right? So you said that. Um, but then you also said models of the world, and I'm just trying to, do you make a distinction between models of the world and the way those are built versus the representations we're learning when we interrogate these end-to-end -end deep neural networks? Uh, I'm just trying to understand the distinction 
between what a model of the world is and just a representation. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, all neural networks learn a model of the world, if you like, if you want to use that phrase, right? They all, essentially, they're learning a mapping between two data sources. And if one of those data sources is sampled from the world, then they're essentially going to encode that represent that, that that data from the world in the parameters of the network in some form, right? So you could call that a model of the world. But, you know, I mean, I think the types of, you know, we were talking earlier about language models and we we're talking, you know, about um, forms of generative model. And what they try to do is they try to predict either, you know, they, a, a subset or a, a, a held out information or a future information from that data set. And in doing so, what they're essentially trying to do is model the distribution from which the information is sampled. I would distinguish that from, you know, in the supervised case where they're essentially learning a mapping to something external, right? And, you know, you can call what's learnt by a CNN, you know, trained on ImageNet with labels. You can call that model of the world if you want. Um, but it's clearly a very different model to the one that you'll get if what you're trying to do is predict what's coming next. Yeah, and, and just... Um... On, on that note, I mean, the other thing that I'm thinking about is when you started talking about constraints and biases and, you know, with Go, you don't need them, but in the real world, you might. That seems to be true for any animal, right? In other words, that seems to be a challenge for any animal. And I think that's very interesting. You, you could argue that way for a cat or a mouse or a non-human primate. But the large language models are very special, right? They're based on human production of language and extracting predictions from language. So do you, are your arguments sort of, that on the one hand, one could begin to build a sort of modular, not just an end-to-end -end architecture like Ida's talking about, and then this notion of constraints in the architecture that seems to be about animals in general, but large language models are very peculiar. They're about human generated language. So are these apples and oranges? In other words, yeah. it seems like they're two separate conversations. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, earlier we talked about generative models and, and we talked about RL, right? So we talked about the, the, the value of information, like being able to model and predict sensory signals. And then we talked about value and actions, right? Being able to behave purposely in pursuit of a goal or maximization of reward, right? And, you know, I think probably, you know, many people would say that those are both important com components of biological systems. And that's because, you know, you can sit there and be very, very clever, but if you don't do anything, you get eaten, right? And you can be very, very fast and very, very motivated, but if you don't know anything about the world, then you'll never find your breakfast, right? So you need both of those components and you know, I think what I was the point I was trying to make is that language model, and this is you know, I think this is a universally shared view. Language models at the moment, you know, they're generative models. They have no explicit sense of purpose, although because there is a sense of purpose baked into the way that humans interact with each other, they can do a pretty good job at recreating it just from a predictive objective. Um, and they actually do know value-based information too, because you know, for example, on the internet there is information about basic economic theory. So you can ask them questions about utility maximization and they will give answers that are similar to the ones humans will give. But that doesn't mean that they have like a value function which they're trying to maximize. Yeah, that, that wasn't, yeah, but that wasn't quite my question. What I was saying is that forgetting about large language models because they are specific to human knowledge. I'm talking about when Ida was asking, having some sort of modular architecture let's let's say in a non-human primate so what what kind of I'm, I'm just trying to understand what where are we with respect to it's not an end-to-end -end model that you don't think is enough it's not a large language model because that's just about humans no other animal has language models so what's the architecture if i understood ida's question that one would want that isn't a large language model let's say it has reward and motivation in it but what kind of architecture are we talking about that isn't either an end-to-end -end monolithic one and isn't a large language model what's the third kind which i think ida was getting at i'm not sure i entirely follow the question you talked about non human it sounded like maybe you were asking me to describe the non-human how the non-human primate brain works was that you you said non-human primate by example i mean yeah uh, m maybe you could rephrase the question because I, I didn't No. I didn't what, I, what i'm saying is is ida was saying 
you can either just scale a monolithic model or you can have some sort of prefrontal architecture in the neural network model. Right, I believe that's something she said. And I'm just asking where we are in that balance in terms of when you have biases and when you don't outside the context of large language models. In well, I mean, words, you know, the, there's the machine learning is a broad and uh, industrious field and you know clearly people are developing ideas on all all sorts of different fronts right and there's lots of work on reinforcement learning there's lots of work on generative modeling there's lots of work on supervised learning there's lots of work on multi-agent research and robotics and probably many other really really important domains that i haven't mentioned and you know kind of in terms of if we care about biology you know i think you know we can think about the sort of triumvirate right of you know having a good generative model having a reward model and you know having some sort of social learning or learning from social others which might take the form of supervision or it might take some other forms right and you know if we want to build an intelligent system if we wanted to build a human-like system which as i said you know maybe we need to think twice about but if we did we would probably want to find the right mixture and the right way of wiring up those different forms of learning and if i think you know your question is like you know, how does that work or what, what, what is that solution space? You know, uh, I mean, there are, there are lots of ways of thinking about this. And I described the one, which is this Merlin architecture, um, you know, kind of there, are, there are of course many others, um, but do any of them generate the types of behaviors that, you know, kind of you might want from a general intelligence? No, absolutely not. And, you know, we've got a long way to go to understand how to mix those three elements. Maybe I add something to that, John, uh, that we touched upon this when we were discussing uh, Blaze's talk and the Palm model at the NACES conference at Cold, Cold Spring Harbor. Um, there is what we were discussing about scaling something simple. Then there is building some model of PFC. And then imagine if you had that model, then this model produced a lot of behavior, the, the PFC-like model, and then you took the outcome of this model and trained another model on those outcomes. That's what the large language models are doing. They're not doing it using a generative, like in the meaning, the meaning of the word generative that we were talking about in terms of the PFC architecture. They're doing it by training on a lot of the outcome of other PFCs in the world, as opposed to actually looking at creating an architecture that's like a PFC, so it will generate outcomes like a PFC and be trained like the PFC. It's trained in a different way. However, because it's trained on the output of a lot of PFCs in the world over history and time, it throws out things that you might think it's PFC-like. However, it is definitely not a model of the PFC as far as I'm concerned. A large language model is not a model of the prefrontal cortex. And I don't think that um, it's even fair to compare it in the same category of things. Uh, I also think even though human, even though primates don't speak, uh, don't use language, we still, our architecture of a human PFC would be more similar to a primate architecture of PFC than the language models. So I just want to mention, because you were saying at some point that you're going to put language models aside because the primate doesn't uh, use language. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that I would say human PFC, the architecture that we want it to be a PFC-like architecture would look a lot more like a, a chimp <laughs> PFC model as opposed to a language model. So I just want to add that to the um, discussion. So it's not the three things compared to each other. It's the scaled versus the brain-like architecture, if that makes sense. Yeah, can I follow up on that? Because I, I, I have, I think this is just a wonderful talk. Thank you so much for, for, for sharing it. Um, you. And, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, we'll recognize um, general intelligence by its behaviors. And I'm wondering whether or not you think that a system that had the same processes or architecture as uh, as a brain or as natural intelligence, but like didn't know much, like didn't have the right priors, didn't have the right experience and couldn't do anything very well, whether or not that would still kind of count as as general in, in intelligence. And, you know, we can we can train like these instances of generalizers or of, of intelligence that, that do quite well. And I you know sometimes wonder whether or not we're just matching like the environmental statistics of the Princeton undergraduates. Like, yeah. uh, you I know, think, could we, and part of this comes from is the right way forward to build things that kind of behave like humans or kind of the kind of more traditional, maybe cognitive psychology approach of understanding isolated processes and kind of 
hope that they kind of hold together, maybe sometimes combined with like rational analysis of understanding the optimal solutions to things like learning or, or generalization. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I get to decide what counts as general intelligence. It would be nice if I did. But <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm I'm the designated one. Um, but I mean, you know, I think we can use terms however we want, right? You know, I think that the fact is that, you know, in the natural world, different animals are adapted to different niches and they have different constraints and objectives and their cognition reflects that, right? You know, that's, you know, rodents are very good at navigating because it's really important to staying alive if you're a rodent, right? Um, you know, we're really good at manipulating objects dexterously, right? Um, and, you know, I, and I would argue, I have argued that correspondingly, the way that space is represented in primates and in rodents is like, you know, kind of there's a different difference of emphasis because of the relative importance of like, you know, kind of the, the, the peripersonal space for reaching and grasping versus allocentric space for, for navigating. So, you know, different animals clearly have different constraints. Um, you know, what counts as generality, I think, is up to you. I mean, you know, I don't I, I don't find actually this, you know, although, um, you know, I use the term in my um, in, in my talk, um, you know, I, I don't think there is one, there's one way of thinking about general intelligence. I think what you're highlighting is a sort of anthropocentrism in the way that we use, uh, we, we use the term. I sometimes wonder if like AI researchers sort of, you know, kind of, they imagine this yeah. general intelligence as being like, you know, it would be, Basically, just a bit like them. It would be like you know, really good at maths and like kind of probably. Like actually, I kind of the opposite question. Like, Sorry to interrupt. I kind of had the opposite question, which is, what's the right strategy for understanding natural intelligence? Is it to build artificial instances of general intelligence that can behave like a person, or is it to understand the architectures and processes that are underlying that natural intelligence, for which there might be other kinds of avenues like rational analysis and process isolation and the kinds of things that cognitive yeah. psychologists. Are I mean, I think I think these are complementary approaches, right? I mean, you know, we've we've used the divide and conquer approach, right? And we've had, you know, first first basic principles, you know, start start with principles like, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, I don't know, optimal inference or um, you know, kind of the Bellman equation, or we've started with these principles, and that's got us some of the way, right? But I think, you know, what the point I tried to get across at the beginning of my talk, I guess, is that AI research. At the very least, it has sort of thrown down a challenge for us, right? And that challenge is sort of to to do what to, to tackle a frontier that most neuroscientists have not really tried to tackle, which is asking about how you integrate information about different bits of the brain and different processes and how they all fit together, right? And you know that challenge is laid down by the fact that if the problem you're trying to solve is not just model data but get an agent that does something in a nat quasi-naturalistic environment, you actually have to solve all of those problems, right? If your agent doesn't have perception, it, it's, you can't see anything, right? If it doesn't have action, it can't move. If it doesn't have memory, you know, it doesn't know what it did last. And so, you know, you need to, you need to solve the problem of putting all those things together. Now, machine learning researchers don't necessarily have the answers, but at least they try, right? Mm -hmm. And for the most part, neuroscientists haven't really tried to do that at all. The only people who have tried are cognitive scientists and cognitive scientists can try because they don't, they don't actually have to be right because they never build or implement the model and they don't really care that much about data, at least most cognitive scientists. I mean, they're also doing causal inference instead of trying to make something that behaves like a human. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, exactly. I mean, clearly it's a the exercise is different and, you know, surprise, surprise, lots of the insights that they came up with have turned out to be really, really valuable. But you know, neuroscience and um, experimental neuroscience has not really grappled with this endeavor, I think. Yeah, I agree. Right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Harrison. Thank you, Harrison, and also congrats on defending your PhD. Newly minted doctor. <laughs> um, Tim, take it away. Hey, uh, sorry, I, I um, hello? hello, Tim. Hi everybody. Um, I, I get a lot of chances to talk to Chris and uh, my wife just got home, so I'm going to be quite brief. <laughs> um, in fact, I'm not really quite sure why you've invited me on, except that I made an inane comment uh, to John, who's just left. Um, but um, I now that Chris has said that neuroscientists don't attempt to solve the brain, I might say something different to what I was going to say. <laughs> I'm not sure that's true. 
present company I, accepted, obviously. Yeah. yeah. What? No, I mean, is, I mean, I, I, I feel like, uh, I feel, I, I, I feel like, from the very start of, like when when people were building representation models before deep nets which they did with like all thousand and fields or with with a lot of people tried to do it piece by piece they they were looking at individual responses in but they were still thinking about a general algorithm that would that would that would work throughout swathes of cortex and there's all the stuff from like building hierarchical layers and vision and all those i i feel like maybe I don't know. Maybe Tommy Poggio was trying to do what you're what you're trying to say. I mean, you know, you you can clearly make the Always case, it. right? But like Alzheimer's and Field didn't care about RL, right? They didn't care about control, right? Which was also happening at the same time, right? You know, it's just a few years after Sadhana Bato, right? And you know, they they didn't care about. Oh, I see. You're saying my you point have to is my point is that yeah. you know. Well. Yeah. People who care about attention generally don't care about, you know, um, maybe it's a bad example because people who care about attention care about everything. But people who care, people, people not who planning, care about not planning, people, they don't care much about planning. <laughs> yeah, that's true. People who care about planning, you know, don't care about, I don't know, you know, um, a basic uh, like object, uh, object recognition. And people who care about audition, you know, don't generally care about episodic memory. And, you know, I mean, of course, there are exceptions, right? And, you know, many people have built successful careers by building bridges between areas. And that's that's really amazing. That's when we make progress. But very few people, what I'm saying in neuroscience, just not, this is not like a critique. It's just because the, the, this, the incentive structure of the field doesn't work that way, right? It's really, really hard to, who, who, apart from Carl Friston, has claimed to have a theory of the whole brain. Like, it's basically just him. I see. Is, and is that are you saying that's a good thing or a bad thing? No, what I'm saying is that it? what I'm saying is that you know when you get people in AI who build like modular structures that mix like you know kind of some sort of encoding model, perceptual or sensory encoding model, some sort of memory system, maybe attention in some way, and then there's a planning system or a control system, they actually have to deal with the problem of how do you wire those things together. Yeah, there is a solution space that is emerging. You know, if you talk to Tim Lillicrap and Greg Wayne, right, they'll be like, well, I think you need this bit and this bit and this bit and this bit, and you need them wired up and you need to do, you know, and it, and it's not even like the solutions they come up will ne come up with will necessarily even be that useful for neuroscience. But it's like at least at least they're thinking about the problem, which we, we just and do you think control, that, right? Do you think that, they're, that when they think about that problem, because when, like, do you think when they think about the problem, they're thinking about it through the brain? or through their understanding of the brain, or they're just literally trying to build it themselves? Uh, you, you'd have to ask them. I mean, you know, both of those people I mentioned have, you know, training as neuroscience, yeah. graduate level training as neuroscientists, right? So I suspect exactly. they'd be more prone to do that than maybe some other people. And, you know, I know that, you know, I, I, I know that both of them care deeply about, you know, brain organization. In the end, probably you need to be pragmatic, right? And, you know, but, uh, you yeah. know, I, I think that the architecture that I referred to, you know, if you, or, or think of any of these sort of, you know, kind of three or four years ago, there was this spate of like world models, like Schmidt Huber had one and whatever. And they're basically like, they have three, you know, three sort of broad components hooked up in a particular way. There's like a generative model, usually a VAE. There's some sort of memory system, which could be an LSTM or it could be some sort of, you know, kind of read write thing, right? And then there's a control policy on top. That is a mini theory of the brain. It says, you know, we've got a, we've got a generative model. We've got something a bit like a hippocampus, and we've got something that's a bit like a basal ganglia prefrontal cortex. I'm just saying that we, you know, you know who else tried to do this? Of course, and I missed him off. John Anderson, right? So, you know, ACTAR is a theory of all of the brain. You know, it's a symbolic AI theory, right? So it doesn't grapple with representation learning, or not in the same way um, that current. Yeah, maybe. I mean, yeah, I, I I think if you spoke to the early computational neuroscientists, they would have had that in their mind but then would have been only dealing with data from one piece of the brain at any one time so then yeah i mean i don't yeah. know i mean anyway um this is a philosophical argument i i feel like uh, i'm uh, intruding on a on a 
on that. Oh, not at all. I, I, I know you talk to Chris a lot, but we don't hear what you guys talk about a lot. So this is amazing for us. <laughs> you don't want to know. Well, well I'm going to I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave on the on the point that I started on this sort of detailed point about hippocampus versus PFC. I'm afraid I'm sh I'm uh, I'm afraid that John's left now. But um, so if, it feels to me that all the people in the rodent literature talk about context. They're talking about memory. They're talking about remapping in hippocampus, and and they have an animal going into the two different rooms or or they change something like the lights or they yeah. um uh and and uh they go in they put them in context a context b context a context b and they can just recognize what context they're in there's no inference or nothing clever required they just have to, they, they just have to um uh say is it a or b and that really is a hippocampal problem i think um uh, whereas I think what you're talking about, or what Earl Miller's talking about, or something like that, is um, is like a schema. More is more like a schema, so, uh, what the rodent people would call a schema. It's like when I'm doing something a bit like this, or a bit like that, or when I'm going to a restaurant, I need to remember to put the knives and forks in the right and left hand. Like you can't remember that. You have to generalize it from previous experiences, and just like in rodents. You don't need hippocampus for that. That's what um, Richard Morris shows. Um, uh, uh, but you um, and you don't need it in in humans either, unless you have to uh, do rapid learning on it. I see. Yeah. So now I understand your point. So so I, yeah. I I agree broadly with the distinction between what you call a schema and what you call a context. Although you know, kind of what you say about explicit context, you know, I mean, clearly remapping can be provoked by changes in latent state, right? So at least yeah, of course. So, uh, and and so, so, related changes too, right? You know, kind of if you change the task, you get some, you get various, you get partial remapping. Of course, right? Exactly. So I think what's going to happen is like Frontex, the frontal cortex is going to compose the current schema out of all of its pieces and it's going to go and tell hippocampus to yeah. remap this bit or that bit. Whereas what John's been looking at or or thinking about is like the whole hippocampal map just changes because it's got an attractor yeah. for this context in it. Uh, basically, and that's what they call full, that's what they call total remapping. Or yeah, so so, so um, I agree. I agree with that. I mean, I wouldn't have used the terms memory and generalization in that way because, like, I mean, I think yeah. that in the prefrontal cortex, yeah. I mean, I think it could be construed as generalization in both cases. And in the prefrontal cortex, you know, you can use memory to solve it in this way, right? You know, note to self, like you know, kind of clearly, you 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 particularly if you have language, right? You can remember explicit rules for doing things, right? Yeah. But and you can use those rules. You by you can dredge up those rules from memory. Like, oh, I'm in Italy. I should drive on the right, right? But I mean, yeah. The the probably um, probably most of what you're talking about, which is what is the appropriate thing to, for me to do right now. You were talking about in the in the context of um of nothing ever being the same twice. That thing is a is in the frontal cortex because you have to like compose all of the pieces of that you know about into like some new thing yeah although remember that patients, patients yeah. with dorsolateral lesions you know can appear pretty normal right so you know you, you you basically the disordered behaviors that you get if you have a you know it's quite it's quite difficult to diagnose what the cognitive impairment is in a patient that has a lesion of like dorsolateral prefrontal cortex right especially if it's unilateral like usually yeah. what happens is they have you know disordered behavior over the long term right so but pretty but, but pretty easy easy to diagnose what, what happens if someone's got a medial frontal lesion absolutely they just do the they just do totally the wrong thing in the wrong context yeah yeah <laughs> effectively exactly. like like they go to prostitutes when they shouldn't or they go i mean that's what they do they do they do things totally in the wrong context the swimming trunks example where they go there. yeah, yeah I can exactly. all of this. and i think the broader point here is that you know often um, we often we talk about model of the world and we sort of mix up this prefrontal element and this hippocampal element, right? You know, often we talk about things like in Nathaniel's uh, two-step task, we talk about, you know, needing a model of the world for that. But for me, that's very much like the prefrontal model, like the schema model that you said. Mm -hmm. And it's different from the map-like model that, you know, presumably we have in the hippocampus and which, you know, you've, you and, and John and others have studied. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's 
uh, I'm not going. Let's not get into it. I think you, I think you can solve Nathan Nathaniel's type in so many ways that I don't yeah, know yeah. which way you're talking about. But, but you understand what I mean? That you can have models of a task, model of a task. In yeah. Oh, yeah. Of a state. Totally. If you've got a model of a task, you try and generalize it. That kind of yeah, I agree. Yeah. Can you hear me? My yeah, mic on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe to just make the hippocampal type models are good for these spatial two or three dimensional tasks, but things that don't map to that map to something else. I don't think it's an either or, it's either hippocampal or not. Uh, put Where you put your knife and fork doesn't seem like a spatial, you know, that kind of spatial task. And um, the, you know, the model-based learning ideas does certainly doesn't have it all in the hippocampus. I think there can be a different systems that are good for certain such problems. Cool. I, I really should go. I, I speak to Chris every day. Okay. I was going to ask you something more, but um, okay, we need to go. <laughs> okay, one more thing, one more thing. Okay, so you contrasted map, like both of you, you contrasted map-like models versus schema-like models. And um, there are some kind of, uh, it, it kind of implies that the approach to modeling the schema-like uh, model of the world or world model would be different. And I wonder um, what kinds are you thinking about? Are you thinking of task sets? Are you thinking of schema like airport? And if so, what kind of architecture are you thinking about? Are you thinking of transformers, mm -hmm. Tim? Or are you thinking of something else? I'm not going to get into architectures. Um, the, but I, um, there is a difference between uh, n knowing what where to go in Heathrow Airport and knowing the general set of things you need to do in airports um and um there's also a difference between uh remember mem remembering a particular set of things you did in heathrow airport yesterday versus generally knowing the layout of heathrow airport and once you've been back to heathrow airport a number of times i don't think you're going to need hippocampus to navigate it that's the kind of things that you make it you can have a schema of Heathrow Airport and you can do different behaviors in it that's the kind of thing that Richard Morris shows so beautifully um and you certainly are not going to need a uh, hippocampus um to represent the general rules of airports although you might need it to spatially navigate in the context of those rules or something like that yeah thank yeah, you exactly. Yeah, super helpful. Yeah. And, and if anything, my understanding of schema would be even more demanding, which would be how to behave in any airport as opposed to just yeah. the airport. Yeah, right. Exactly. So I was trying to make the point that, you, that a schema that you can actually have scheme, schemas at different levels, right? So, what's you think about the Morris schema, and those the Morris schema is is um, like really is 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 one level down from the kind of schema that you or Chris Balasano or someone would talk about, right? Because they're like you can make a schema of an individual layout, like of Heathrow Airport. If you see it often enough, you make a schema of that, and that gets moved out of hippocampus as well. And then, and then you, and then um, you can do rapid learning in it once once it's in cortex. Um, yeah, uh, but then of course you can then do more schema. You can further schematize that if you see lots of different similar layouts, um, and uh, and make. Uh, a schema of all airports or all travel or that kind of stuff yeah exactly. would it be fair to say that schema are kind of map of latent states and uh, in order to derive and translate those latent states to actual policy then pfc is needed uh is it okay to i mean so i'm um a, a um fan of old miller's ideas on on, on, on which is that uh you need pfc to set up all the all the you need, you need pfc to understand the context which or the where you are which schema what's the current appropriate thing uh but then all of the um uh all of the uh m machinery of of what you should do in that situation is done by control pfc controlling what goes on in the back of the brain that would be my my sort of simple like simplistic uh, argument of it and I, I think that that's what that's what erlen and jonathan so eloquently say in that paper that makes sense but i'm adding something further to it after our knowledge of 30 years later after that paper yeah. which is that uh, there could be that that schema of an of any airport when it once it's generalized it could be thought of as a map of the latent state 
space of oh yeah, yeah no i totally yeah. i totally I, I sorry sorry yes i was I the, second, the second half of your comment not the first i totally agree with you uh that a really nice way of uh, like once you have latent representations they perform abstractions they look like schemas i totally agree with you um and so um that's a really nice way of thinking about it computationally thank you so uh, much just, go on go just ahead. just add maybe one thing which is that you know kind of the prefrontal cortex seems to deal with actions differently to the hippocampus and it seems to deal with time differently right and the prefrontal cortex is clearly like it's a control system it's a memory-based control system right that controls what actions you're going to take ultimately, right um over the near or the longer term and you know um that that means that the nature of the model-based representation for me it multiplexes future actions into the representation in a way which you know my limited understanding of the hippocampus is that there's not so much evidence for that and it also seems to deal with time in a different way as well right because you know clearly prefrontal cortex is about temporary maintenance in the service of I control I would, so I, um, other people think the hippocampus maintains information over time in a similar way maybe maybe i'm out of my depth talking about hippocampus with would, two experts here i agree I about strong, the hippocampus sorry. not being really action oriented but there's pretty solid evidence of a rat imagining certain paths uh, yeah, in certain exactly. directions and choosing one so that's gets it, it definitely towards. has actions but it's not in egocentric way. so it you, it so it, it can it can plan out its future with actions it can um Imagine other animals taking actions. It can do all sorts of fun things. Uh, that it's really hard, I think, to argue that it doesn't know about actions. It's just that it represents actions in the same way that it represents other things in allocentric space. And so I they don't feel like, yeah, they don't feel like actions to you and me because they're not like move your muscles. They're, uh, yeah, they're like, what's the state of the system going to be next? Yeah, and they have also policy. Hippocampus also has policy dependent representations of the exactly. world. So the, yeah. the, the actions, even over long stretches of time, gets baked into the kind of predictive representation the hippocampus produces. And it also has different time scales. So I agree with you, the PFC has a higher time scales and deals with time completely differently. But the hippocampus also has some level of time along the long axis, where you have uh, more close to each other associations in posterior, aka dorsal, and more further apart when you go to anterior. Um it's 11 30. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Tim. It's been Sorry amazing. For no, not at all. It was amazing. Thank you. Um, Javier, do you want to go next? Hey, Javier. Nice That's to see you. Cool. Hey, Chris. Um, yeah, I'll go next. This is just very general. <laughs> it's not really anything new for me, in particular, but um, I guess that the free energy principle was mentioned, and uh, one thing I've frequently heard in reference to it is that it's great, but it's so general, it's uninformative. So what do you do with that? And it makes me think about, you know, what is it that we are trying to do? Are we trying to come up with theory of the brain or theory of intelligence? Um, are those, how, how overlapping are those questions? You know, are we trying to take some sort of like physics like approach where we come up with first principles and we can derive everything from those first principles, we could derive any new intelligent system based on that. And our brain is just one instance of it. I don't know. These are all just interrelated questions. I was, I'm not asking you to defend any of these ideas. I know it's been, it's been asked of you to defend some of these ideas, just interested in your opinion on them. Sure. I think different people have different objectives, right? So, you know, I certainly wouldn't um, pretend to speak for Carl or for other apologists for this particular framework. I mean, I guess the thing, one thing to say about the free energy framework is that it's quite closely related to a number of you know kind of approaches in machine learning that use variational inference to do generative modeling right um uh you know and many of the quantities which are computed you know kind of com computing free energy you, you know the, these these are sort of you know bread and butter components of um of generative modeling although you know clearly there are unique uh, features to the specific instantiation in in predictive coding and in the, the so-called free energy principle. Um, and I think, you know, kind of that has all, that's, you know, clearly the goal there is to offer, you know, a sort of unified theory of the brain, right? Um, in terms of a single computational principle. I guess my view is that, you know, this is, I guess, you know, sort of what discussion we're having with Tim maybe is that there isn't necessarily one sort of overarching unified 
you know, monolithic computational principle, you know, it's not just transformers scaled to a trillion parameters. It's not just, you know, kind of uh, predictive processing over multiple hierarchical layers, but the brain is modular. It does different stuff. It solves different problems. Those different problems are the problems thrown up by the natural world. And, you know, kind of uh, the, the brain is a bit messy because the world is a bit messy. Now, what do you do with that? Well, you can do different things. I mean, you know, my, my, uh, my the approach I've taken in my lab, as I think you know, is to like, you know, try to tackle a few of these different areas sort of in parallel and then try to assimilate some of the evidence, right? So to think jointly about, you know, kind of planning and decision making, about learning and inference, um, about memory tasks um, and visual cognition to some extent, and then try to, you know, think about how they all fit together. Um, you know, that's that's one approach. But, you know, I also, you know, I learn probably most from people who have a very different approach and who have gone in, um, you know, and studied one system in, you know, great detail and, you know, kind of revealed really, you know, kind of substantial insights about how that functions, either in terms of computation or in terms of, you know, systems, um, organization or, or whatever. So... I, I don't advocate for any of these different, I think they're all really useful. Um, and we all do what we all do what we think we might do best, right? <laughs> or maybe what, you know, keep, makes us least bored, I guess. Also what pays the bills. Well, that's true, <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. I just wanna maybe finish, I know it's very late there, by reading uh, Hugo's question, cause I, uh, I promised to ask questions. And I always feel like, uh, I, I always feel guilt if I don't get to the uh, so Hugo asks, are there examples from other animals we can learn from where their difficulties in transfer tells us something that helps us give insight to the evolution of disability in humans? So the goal is to understand the evolution of transfer in humans. Can we learn something about failures of transfer in animals about the evolution of transfer in humans? This is a really super question. It's a really, really super question. I'm not going to do justice to it without thinking about it for more time. But I mean, I suffice to say that like, you know, kind of this has been a this has been a difficult area. Right. So, you know, we know that a vast sort of menagerie of bizarre animals can, for example, do same different judgments, or at least there is experimental evidence arguing that they can do same different judgments over reasonably like strong forms of transfer. Right. So, you know, bees taught to detect an odd one out in orientation can then apparently one shot generalize that to odd one out in um, color, for example. Um, you know, if you believe the Nature paper from 1990, whenever it was, that makes that claim, right? I mean, you know, I'm sure that there are experts who will tell me there are caveats, but that's surprising because, you know, kind of, you know, sameness judgment or non-trivial sameness judgment is something that, you know, kind of even you know, kind of powerful deep convolutional neural networks really struggle with. And even like relational networks, which are explicitly, you know, kind of have explicit inductive biases to try to learn, you know, relational patterns, slimness is clearly a relational pattern, um, you know, struggle with forms of, with strong forms of generalization like that. Um, so the question was, can we learn, what can we learn from human transfer from failures in animals? I'm not sure I really have a good answer to that. Um, but, you know, I think the first answer is that maybe animals can do perhaps forms of transfer, which, you know, kind of it's quite perplexing how they might solve that with, you know, kind of the small, um, you know, relatively computationally modest brains that they have. Um, and secondly, I guess questions of transfer in other animals are sort of tied up more generally with questions of, you know, what can those animals do, right? So you sort of endless debates about when you, you know, if you observe you know, kind of monkeys in social groups, they seem to dis display like incredibly rich, like one shot generalization, you know, they'll do incredible things like they'll understand from a single instance, that you know, kind of if a dominant um, member of the troop can see a, a, a food item, then they shouldn't approach it, you know, and they're all, all that they're inferring that, you know, kind of just from the arrangement, just from the gaze of that animal, what that, that that animal will then come and you know in, uh, then come and potentially attack them if they take the food you know they can do these really crazy sort of one shot type um, behaviors um, but then you know you put them in the lab and you know it takes them a year and a half to learn the dot motion task right so you know I think that really it's very very difficult to understand what 
different animals can transfer. And yeah, I would love to think more about the question, but I don't have a good answer. Thank you so much. You've been extremely generous with your time. You have addressed everybody's questions in details. This has been incredible. I'm obviously, I've uh, been a fan of your work since I was in grad school working on the prefrontal cortex using, you know, machine learning and fMRI. And I'm still thinking about the same models I was thinking about, hoping to create a better model of the PFC. So I really want to thank you. I really appreciate the depth with which we address some of these questions. If anybody on the screen wants to say something before we move on, please go ahead. All right, no? Okay, John, thank great. you so much. And Javier, yeah, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you all for your question. I didn't get time. I would like to, I don't know if it's possible to save the sidebar. I would love to read all the questions. I think Claire can send you the sidebar. Absolutely. You get the, you get the final word. Just before you say the final words, I just want to say that the next session is David Batter, another a uh, very prominent uh, PSC and task set expert. And he just had a recent book that's over there. So I can just tell you, it's called On Task. It's a beautiful color um, teal cover if you want to get a paperback. And I recommend that everybody reads it before next time if they can or read parts of it because it's always more fun to discuss a book. And please take it away, um, Chris, with some final words. <laughs> no, all I want to say is thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And um, uh, to John as well and, you know, to everyone who contributed. I've learned a lot speaking to you all this evening. I really enjoyed the conversation. And, yeah, I will um, look forward to joining more. Uh, members, more, more, more learning salons as an audience, as an audience member. It will be our honor and pleasure. Please come back. <laughs> good night, everyone. What's that? Good night. Oh, good night. Good From night, everyone. <laughs>